Distinguished guests, greetings. I'm Henry Kim, Operations Director at the Korean Society of Media and Arts. Welcome all of you to this international conference, co-hosted by Kaon International Triennial 2021, AICA International, and the Korean Society of Media and Arts. I'm very honored and privileged to moderate today's international conference. This international online conference is held as part of Kaon International Triennial 2021 Warm Revitalization, held from September 30th to November 7th in four different venues in Hongcheon under the theme of Revitalization vitalization of everyday life through technology and art in the Anthropocene Epoch. I hope that this conference serves as a meaningful place to explore the desirable practical direction of daily revitalization and to look into the daily life that may unfold in the future by examining technological art or academic thinking and practical cases where technology and art converge in the Anthropocene era like today. First, I'd like to turn to Mr. Tajin Kim, President of Korean Society of Media and Arts, and Kim Shil Kang, Chairman of uh, Common Art and Cultural Foundation, and Lisbeth Robala Gonzalez, ICANN International President, for their opening remarks. Distinguished guests, Congratulations on the opening of 2021 Gangwon Triennale. I'm Taejin Kim, the president of the Korean Society of Media and Arts. It is such a great pleasure for the Korean Society of Media and Arts to co-host this international academic conference. The Korean Society of Media and Arts started as the Seoul Media Research Society in 1996 and since its official launch in 1998 under its current name, we have been working toward the goal of convergence between academia, industry, art, design, and creation and theory related to video media. As the implementation of visual image is being perfected and the advances in the video technology greatly changes the landscape of life within various social networks, we are making academic efforts to predict and prepare for the future in relation to the media environment. The theme of this iteration of uh, Kangwon Triennale Warm Revitalization is related in many ways to the academic topics covered by the society. Last year's academic symposium was held under the theme of Separately and Together, and in 2019, the theme was Media Companion. The previous editions of the conference based on the understanding of the alienation of humans and nature in the process of technological development, looked back on the current pandemic situation and discussed whether we would be able to overcome isolation and restore true love for humanity and the advanced media technology to truly establish itself as a companion of mankind. The theme of this International Academic Conference, the age of the Anthropocene, everyday regeneration through technology and art, considers issues such as the climate crisis confronting human society, the alienation of labor caused by the technological revolution and the decline of local communities and discuss how we overcome this through technological innovation and artistic efforts. I believe that researchers and creators from various fields we put their hearts and heads together and start a long journey to find a way to bring worms to the marginalized parts of the planet. I truly hope that today's meaningful dialogue will lead to constructive discussions and initiate small changes that will warm and transform this society. I sincerely wish you a successful hosting of 2021 Kaon Triennale. Thank you. Greetings. I am Kang Gum Shil, the chair of Kangwon Cultural Foundation. The theme of the 2021 Kangwon Triennale is Warm Revitalization. In the era of the Anthropocene, we are holding this very important international academic conference to find a way for it and a form a discourse on the regeneration of everyday life by bringing technology and art together. Congratulations. Thank you very much to all the participants and those who have made this conference as possible. Technology is actually one of the most negative contributors to the Anthropocene, all at the same time as we move through the Anthropocene, it will not be possible without technological innovation to pursue a warm revitalization. So I'm very much looking forward to how art and technology are put together from the point of view of art based on artist perspectives in order to restore daily life. I will listen attentively. Thank you. I'm very much pleased to greet you all at the opening of this very important Congress, 
which takes place on the occasion of the Gangwon Triennale in Korea. I would like to appreciate the efforts of Song Ho Kim, the artistic director of the Gangwon Triennale, to invite ICA International as a co-organizer of this conference, focused on the theme of the revitalization of everyday life through technology and art in the Anthropocene epoch. It is indeed a very relevant theme in the current days. I'm sure this conference will bring us an extraordinary contribution, offering a myriad of viewpoints about these crucial subjects of the existing times. I congratulate the organizers of the Triennale and of this conference through Sung Hu Kim. I want to greet the speakers who will participate in this very meaningful debate and I want to welcome the audience. I wish you all an excellent meeting. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to see such a valuable cooperation among the Korean Society and Media and Arts, AICA International, and the Kangwon International Triennale 2021. This conference was also made possible thanks to the unsparing support from Kangwon Art and Culture Foundation, Kangwon Province, Hong Chun Gun, and Hong Chun Culture Foundation. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Choi Gyun Shin, Chairman of the Steering Committee of Kangwon Triennale, for his greetings. Greetings. I'm Shin Choi Gyun, the Chairman of the Kangwon Triennale Steering Committee. I'd like to thank all of you for taking part in and arranging the 2021 Kangwon Triennale International Academic Conference as presented and discussed amid the situation where all countries are facing unprecedented challenges brought about by the pandemic, 2021 Country Annually is an art festival that started with the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. This year marks the first year of transitioning to the triennale format to bring differentiation and originality. It is an event that carries the aspiration for transforming the entire region. This year's conference is very meaningful as it seeks to explore the practical direction of the regeneration of everyday life by putting together science and technology achieved by humans and art to meet the various challenges today. There is such an expectation for this conference as well as for the Triennale. I hope today's presentations and discussions, which will lead to various discourses, formulate strategies to help us step to the Anthropocene era and set the directions to pursue. I also hope that this will serve as an opportunity for the Triennale to be firmly established as a global art festival. I hope this conference, which is held under challenging circumstances, will be successfully concluded, and the discourses in this conference will become a cornerstone to suggest the future direction of art and a stepping stone for Kawan Triennale. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope this conference sets forth an overarching vision for Kawan Triennale as well. Now, I would like to turn to Artistic Director Song Wu Kim of Kaon Triennale for his keynote. Song Wu Kim received his bachelor's degree in Western Painting and his master's from Chungyang University. He received his DEA in Philosophy from the University of Paris, his PhD in Aesthetics and Art Studies from the University of Sorbonne. He served as a curator at Moran Museum of Art, the editor-in-chief of the Museum again, the director of the Kunst Art Gallery, and he also served at Chungang University and the Utsa National Institute of Science and Technology. He was the artistic director of many art festivals and biennial, including Tom Sculpture Biennial. He is a member of the International Association of Art Critics, the Korean Art Critic Association, and the Korean Curators Association. He authored critical biography of creator Wan Yun Lee and many other books. And he is an active art critic. Let's invite him for the theme and the significance of this international symposium. Yeah, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the where of you are. I'm Song Wu Kim, Artistic Director of Kaman International Triennale 2021. Today, we host an international conference under the theme of revitalization of everyday life through technology and art in the Anthropocene Epoch, co-hosted by Kaman Triennale 2021, ICA International, and the Korean Society of Media and Arts. At this conference, 
we will discuss and share a wide range of discourses on the theme of revitalization of everyday life through technology and art in the Anthropocene epoch. Before moving on to today's program, I would like to briefly introduce Kangwon International Triennale 2021. Building on the experience of hosting the first Pyeongchang Biennial in 2013, Biennial had been held every two years, and the format was recently reorganized into a triennale format from a long-term perspective. The first triennale was held in Hongcheon. Kangwon Triennale event is a three-year nomad project. Exhibitions tour the entire Gangwon province every three years. The first edition of Gangwon Triennale in Hongcheon started with the Gangwon Artist Show in 2019, continued with the Gangwon Kids Triennale 2020, and concludes with the Gangwon International Triennale 2021. Under the theme of warm revitalization, we prepared this international conference as well as the exhibition to brace ourselves for the post-pandemic era brought about by COVID-19 and various diseases. Amid the Anthropocene, we would like to contribute to presenting prospect for regeneration and recovery. Today's international conference will be in line with the academic conference held in August this year. On August 24, 2021, an academic conference was held with Korean experts on the theme of regional regeneration through equal art. In light of the pandemic-induced crisis, the conference discussed and looked into the desirable direction of sustainable local revitalization through equal art. The theme of today's international conference is revitalization of everyday life through technology and art in the Anthropocene epoch. At this conference, we will look at various discourses focusing on technology art. Pre-recorded presentations will be followed by questions and answers. The first presentation will be delivered by Professor Hyung Kim, and artist Sungu Han will join as a discussant. Second presenter is Professor Sung Chul Shin of Gangneung Wanju National University. His presentation is titled The Role of Art as Techne from the Point of View of Technical Aesthetics. Artist Chen Sai Hua Kwan of Singapore will pose questions on the presentation. The third presentation, the relationship between ecotechne and everyday life from the point of view of cultural critique, will be delivered by Malgozarta Kazmierzak, independent curator of Poland, Jen Yano Kim Chang, artistic director of Aigong, alternative visual culture factory, will serve as a discussant. The fourth session is on technology and art in the Anthropocene epoch from the point of view of sociology of art. The presenter is Kim Levin, former AICA international president, and the discussant is research professor Huan Shim of the Institute of Media Arts of Yonsei University. The first four sessions focus more on revitalizing theory-related discourses. From the fifth session onwards, the focus will be more on critical discourses related to the actual art scene. Session five is on contactless digital network and art scene from the point of view of art critique. The presentation will be delivered by Jin Guk An, art critic, and Eunuk Shim, art critic, will join in as a discussant. The sixth 
presenter is Damien Smith, independent curator and art writer of Australia. His presentation is on simulacre as fiction in media and reality focus on case analysis. The discussant is Hyunjin Shin, independent researcher of Korea. Section 7 will be joined by Sang Gu, CEO of FAB 365 of Korea, who will give his presentation on design and revitalization of the digital everyday life focused on case analysis. And discussant Anka Lasniak of Poland. The eighth session is on media art on the theme of ecology, artists, and artworks. Jean Bundy, art writer of the U.S., will make her presentation, and Young Ai Ryu of Asia Culture Institute will pose questions on the presentation. The last session is on media art on the theme of AI and augmented reality, artist and artworks. The last presenter is Chang Han Kang, Korean artist. Discussant is Xia Yuan Hua, art critic of China. I hope today's international conference with nine presenters and discussants is an opportunity for all of us to explore various interdisciplinary thinking, bringing together technology and art and actual cases, in particular, the role of art responding to the Anthropocene. And through this, this conference serves as a valuable academic platform looking into the daily life in the future. Thank you very much. Now let's proceed with the presentations and discussions. The theme of this conference is Revitalization of Everyday Life Through Technology and Art in the Anthropocene Epoch. We will have five presentations from Korean presenters from the point of view of art history, technical aesthetic, cultural critics, sociology of art, and art criticism. In the following four sessions, we will listen into the case studies and introduction of artworks by artists and art practitioners. First presenter is Professor Hyun Kim of Gungmin University. She received her PhD in art history from the University of Iowa, United States. Her most recent book is Black Mountain College's Labs for Future Education Through Art. She has published numerous academic papers including Electronic TV by Nam Jun Park and Resistance to Controlled Time. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you are. Thank you for having me at the Kangwon Triennale 2021 International Symposium. I'm Kim Hee Young of Kungmin University. Today I'd like to talk about changes in art integrated with technological development from an art historian point of view. It is no exaggeration to say that human history has developed in relation to technological development. Humans have constantly advanced technology to define their own lives, and now technology has become an important part of human life. Since the 20th century, also dubbed as the center of speed, the technological advances have been accelerating and the relationship between humans and technology has been reflected in various ways of art. Modern science and technology have brought about important changes to how art works are created, viewed, and appreciated and understood. While enjoying the convenience that technology brings, on the other hand, we feel threatened by the pace and power of technological development and the human status as a creative project that can be distinguished from technologies highlighted. The ambivalence of technological advancement is expressed in various ways through the avant-garde authors and thinkers of the 20th century. However, in the modern environment made of highly advanced technology, technology is no longer a tool for humans but exists as another subject that coexists with humans. This presentation examines the mutual relationship between technology and art based on cybernetics theory and examines the position of Roy Ascot, the proposed behaviorist art that combined art with telematics art.
The interactive relationship between technology and art has changed the way people communicate. With such changes, we would like to take a positive view on the possibility of expanding the autonomous human experience that is ultimately not subject to technology. Early 20th century avant-garde authors and writers, including futurists and Dadaists, were obsessed with the mechanical aesthetics. The mechanical images shown in the works of German Dadaist writer Zosie Krauss and Lau Hausmann suggest power or dictatorship or represent hope for the future of technology. New York Dadaist artist Frances Cabia said, machine is no longer just an accessory to life. It is a real part of human life, perhaps it is a human soul. Picavia is best known for creating iconic portraits abstracted from combinations of mechanical parts. This 1914 work, Girl Born Without a Mother, also hints at mechanical production. And in the portraits of the painter, painter Mari Lorenzen or the photographer Alfred Stiglitz symbolically embodied as mechanical parts or camera parts. One can see that the force of modern technological development is flexibly embraced. Meanwhile, coming to face to face with the irresistible power of modern machines, Louis Montfort argued that man can transcend machines only when he has the ability to assimilate with it. In other words, he explains that uh, we cannot become more fully human if humans do not embrace the machine's objectivity, inhumanity, and neutrality that humans lack. He thought that the essential characteristics of a machine, such as precision, calculation, integrity, simplicity, and economy, can promote human desire for order and organization, as Picabia mentioned in 1915. Technology has become an integral part of our lives. Therefore, rather than recognizing technology as an enemy that threatens human subjectivity, it will be necessary to find concrete ways for humans and technology to coexist. Various attempts are being made to reconsider the relationship between humans and machines and to apply them to art. While mechanical aesthetic works in the early 20th century symbolically fused the shapes of humans and machines to reproduce curiosity about machines, as a highly advanced technology, technology interacts with humans, technology is embraced as a medium of art and renewing the meaning of works of art. Whereas art has traditionally focused on representing reality, new media art that embraces technology provides an open space to experience reality from a fresh perspective. Meanwhile, the theory of cybernetics proposed by the Hungarian-born mathematician Norbert Wiener right after the Second World War was an important turning point for the relationship between humans and technology to transition to a reciprocal understanding. It is associated with extensive research on communication and control in animals and machines. This theory has a major impact on how scientists redefine what they study. Prior to the introduction of cybernetics theory, technology was largely defined and perceived as mechanical. The movement of forces showing observable physical changes in isolated objects was the subject of study, and technology was thought of as things that moved, recorded, calculated, and acted like a clock. However, as communication and control became the subject of research, the basis for research changed. Communication and representation presented by Winner are, in some ways, interactivity. Cybernetics conceived by Winner is about relationship, not essence. In cybernetics, communication is regarded as a probable act that takes place in a probable world. In this context, patterns associated with information have important meaning because the cybernetics concept pays attention to the transfer of patterns rather than communication of the essence. As data moves across various types of interfaces, patterns are transferred to different aspects through analogical relationships moving across borders. Winner proposes a maintained relationship between living organisms and mechanical systems based on the transfer and communication by means of analogy. Winner 
or proposes an organic relationship based on such means of analogy. Cybernetics theory ultimately aims to enable humans to lead a better and freer life in a technological society because humans are becoming more dependent on machines and interactions with machines are becoming the norm in society. We may believe that the smooth communication between humans and machines has a positive impact on human inner health. He explained that human communication should be a model for human-machine and machine-to-machine interaction, which is the underlying premise behind all human-computer interactivity. Wiener cybernetics theory was later developed by Leiter, who proposed the idea of a symbiotic relationship between humans and machines. Claiming to renew the perception of computers, he explained that computers can function much more efficiently when they work with humans, that humans can do much better by interacting with them than by doing them alone. He thought through a cooperative relationship between humans and machines, the tremendous creative potential of humans is released. On the other hand, it was not easy to find a clear interface between cybernetics theory and art based on reflection on the relationship between humans and machines. So metaphor was used to explain the connection. The basis for the convergence of cybernetics and art has been gradually built within the context of contemporary art which has continued to experiment with the aesthetics of time, movement, and processes. The application of cybernetics to art depends on artists' desire and ability to, cons to conceptually link scientific principles with contemporary aesthetic discourse. In the application of cybernetics of art, the role of Roy Asgood, who was interested in the interactive and temporal properties of art in the 1960s, is notable. In 1961, Roy Asgott, who encountered social theory in cyberspace, finds the theory similar to the interactive art he was practicing. Accordingly, he proposed the prospect of integrated art by combining aesthetic theory and cybernetic theory with interactivity. He believed that the artist has a responsibility to give shape to the world and to change the world, and thus he expressed his interest in the progressive art. Also influences education. Roy Asgott established a theoretical framework for understanding interactive works by integrating the characteristics of cybernetics, avant-garde art, especially Dadaist surrealism, Bloxist movement, and pop art. The interactive art he proposes is based on the premise of breaking away from the modernist ideal of presenting a perfect object as a result. He believes that the works of art should be responsive to the viewer rather than remaining static. He said that the cybernetic spirit is most effective in establishing a two-way exchange between the work of art and the viewer and he proposes subnetics and the corresponding active art. This means that the spectator is engaged and the work of art must act in the same way. An artist who wants to create a probable structures can create works of art from biological models that have a system of growth. Cybernetics theory, which pays attention to probabilities and explores interdependent relationships, addresses the nature of growth. He sees that if the cybernetic spirit is the dominant attitude of the modern era, then the computer is the best tool to modern technology ever produced. He also explains that the computer is not limited to a physical tool that expands physical power, but it is a tool for the mind, a medium for expanding thought, and potentially a tool for expanding the intellect. 
He asserts that human-computer interaction is possible in creative activity through human imagination and the interaction of artwork and computer within a behaviorist structure can also be predicted. In this way, Asuka positively embraces the utility of computers for the arguing that artists should recognize and actively use information technology as an important tool. He foresees the possibility of artistic collaboration among and between people participating through electronic networks even though they are far away. In the 1960s, when Marshall McLuhan's prophetic theory of a global village made possible by a new medium has not yet been technologically realized, Asgard devel as developed an artistic discourse that projected the idea of global collaboration. He thought about the way in which the medium of uh, communication facilitates interactive and consensual exchanges and then based on the concept of telematics, explored the possibility of telematic art. Asgard explains that McLuhan's media theory is very important in providing a perspective on how electronic media enables immediate and simultaneous communication through the electronic expansion of the central nervous system and creates a socially interdependent global village. At the time, in Lewin's books, The Gutenberg Galaxy, published in 1962, and Understanding Media, published in 1964, were already widely read. However, Ascot's paper, Behaviorist Art and the Cybernetic Region, published in 1967, where Ascot proposed at the end of the paper that the art that embraced electronic networks was regarded as a science fiction. Science fiction asked for so the convergence of cybernetics and telematics by articulating plans to use computers and telecommunications to jointly interact with distant participants. As such, telematics constitutes an extensive global network through which information between interconnected elements can be circulated. Telematics implies a potential exchange of information between every node in the network. However, this effort to explore the interactive possibilities in the art by embracing electronic networks was not fully understood in contemporary art back then. While media theory was proposed in the 1960s and various discussions on the relationship between art and technology were developed, the software exhibition held in New York in 1970 still hinted at skepticism about technology. Exhibition creator Jack Burnham wanted to embody his research on the new relationship between IT and art through this exhibition. He stated that information technology, a new meaning for art as the subtitle of this exhibition, actively used computers in the exhibition. However, he made it clear that art and technology are essentially different areas with different structures. He used Marshall Duchamp's The Large Glass, The Bright Stripped Bear by Her Bachelors, even as a concept architectural prototype for the installation of this exhibition. What is presented in the absence of a large glass would be translated as the bright naked even by her bachelors. He said, well, actually, this large piece of work is made of glass. So when you see it in the gallery, then you can see the space behind it. He noted that the large glass structure clearly divided the brighter realm of enigmatic form and the bachelor's realm made up of uh, mechanical figures. And Jack Burnham analyzed this work, saying that Duchamp's Duchamp made art through this work, and artists with a desire to rob art are slowly trying to undress it, and the art will end when it is wearing nothing. That is what the exhibition tried to show. So the bride was viewed as art, and the artists were viewed as bachelors. In the software exhibition, Jack Burnham intentionally combined the realm of this bride, the abstract forms of conceptual art, with the mechanical forms of the technical non-art, the realm of these virtualist technology, to heighten the tension, conflict, or antagonism between the two. 
Ultimately, Jack Borne wanted to show the gap between art and technology through this exhibition. He showed that technology could not contribute to the system of meaning that mediates the mythical structure of Western art. We can see through this exhibition that the skepticism about technology remained, even though the exhibition was held. In the exhibition was held in the late 20th century when there was a serious interest in technology. However, we cannot underestimate technology as a technological tool that cannot contribute to shaping the symbiotic and symbolic meaning of human beings. We need to face the reality of coexistence with the human environment or technology, which is already a major part of forming humans, understand the meaning and the form of art, the way of art is the way art is made, and the changes it brings to the way of distributing and sensibility. Art that embraces digital technology does not remain only as a feat of creation of a new form made with a new medium. These changes challenge the definition of modernist art, which focuses on the materiality of the medium and limited the perception and appreciation of art as a visual medium. Rather than the presenting the finished work unilaterally, the interaction between the viewer and the work has become an important factor in shaping the meaning of an artwork. The discussion of interactivity between humans and technology is linked to exploring the possibility of expanding the relationship between humans and technological others. I believe that we are at the turning point where we will consider the new role of art and the social meaning of technology in transforming the in human society, resulting from the development of advanced technology into a human one. This ultimately leads to a discussion about the expansion of autonomous human communication and experience that is not subject to technology. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. She gave us a good overview of how technology and art have interacted and related within the context of art history. Also, I was very impressed with her presentation regarding cybernetics' influence on telematic art and behaviorism and the explanation of Jack Burnham's skepticism of technology through Duchamp's work. Furthermore, the presentation has given us a food for thought as to the roles and social meanings of technology and art, and the changes in the lives of human communities down the road. Now, I would like to turn to artist Sun Bu Han's questions and Professor Kim's response. Sun Bu Han is an artist who works in three-dimensional and media works, majoring in sculpture and artistic engineering, and has participated in numerous domestic and international exhibitions. The themes of his works are the removal, reinforcement, and extension series of social masks, and a series of healing for personal war, social own and scars. He's currently working kinetic works, MR works, and uh, games that converge three dimensional and virtual. Distinguished guest, I'm Sung Gu Han. I would like to ask two questions about Hyun Kim's presentation from the perspective of an artist. This is my first question. To help understand the relationship between technology and art and their interaction, the presenter gave extensive explanations about Roy Ascot's telematic art. And toward the end of the presentation, she said, quote, I hereby propose to expand the discussion on the change in the forms of art and life caused by technology while at the same time seeking an open perspective toward human autonomy, unquote. Yet these days, research is being done extensively on the force industry as a technology for humans and nature. I'd like to ask the presenter against this backdrop in what direction should the discussion on technology, humans, and art go and expand in the era of the fourth industrial revolution? Furthermore, I would like to ask the presenter to elaborate on the open perspective towards human autonomy from technology. Turning to the second question, the visual arts scene is actively adopting technology. In particular, since the outbreak of COVID-19, the interest in technology has heightened dramatically 
as the art scene started to look for a breakthrough. Such a phenomenon has enabled art, a relatively closed area, to be connected with the general society through technology at a rapid pace. In fact, metaverse exhibition halls have been rapidly built recently, and a new social market has been created where artworks are traded with virtual currencies such as NFTs. This shows that art is advancing in a completely different direction from where it is now thanks to technology. However, as Jack Burnham's exhibition software mentioned by the presenter, even today, artists embrace and use technology with lingering skepticism. For instance, in the objective realm of human work, the interaction between human and machine seems to be underway as we can see in the use of artificial intelligence for the generation of a specific value and applies it to production where humans make a decision about a certain event based on the interpretation by artificial intelligence. Yet in the realm of art, many artists seem to think that the subject aesthetics and formativeness of artists, which have been highlighted since modernism, stand opposite to the language of machines. I believe that for the interaction between or coexistence of art and technology, art needs to embrace the disparate language of technology as it does tools for painting and sculpture. The misconception that technology lacks the subjectivity of the artist, unlike a chisel for carving wood, continues to hinder the coexistence of technology and art, I believe. I would like to ask about the presenter's take on the level of coexistence of art and technology in Korea and the ways to make those who have negative perception on technology or are afraid of technology invading the realm of art have a universal acceptance of technology. That's all I have. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the insightful questions on my presentation on changes in art integrated with technological development from an art historical point of view. The discussant asked two questions regarding my proposal to expand the discussion on the change in the form of art and life caused by technology while at the same time seeking an open perspective toward the human autonomy. The discussant asked in what direction should the discussion on the fourth industrial revolution should develop and what an open perspective toward the human autonomy from technology means. And the second question is rather broad regarding the coexistence of art and technology. The discussant proposed that for the interaction between or coexistence of art and technology, art needs to embrace the disparate language of technology as it does the tools for painting and sculpture. The discussant also asked about the ways to make those who have negative perception on technology or are afraid of technology invading the realm of art have a universal acceptance of technology. I believe the two questions are related to each other, so rather than addressing them individually, I would like to supplement my presentation to answer the questions. As demonstrated in the software exhibition curated by Jack Burnham in the 1970s, the idea that an artist's subjective aesthetics and formativeness are confronted with machine language tends to dominate in contemporary art. However, I think that modern art represented by Duchamp Land and new media art represented by Turing Land meet in an area where there is no distinction between medium and content, as Marshall McLuhan predicted, rather than remaining as two isolated areas that cannot be brought together. Digital technologies such as electronics, computers, and global networks are already shaping our environment and changing our lifestyles and have also brought important changes to the way we communicate. The use of this advanced technology medium in artistic expression is a natural reaction and phenomenon rather than a disparate one. 
In my presentation, I looked at the defensive attitude to the threat of technology presented by Jack Burnham as an example of the resistance seen in embracing technological change in art history. However, even in this exhibition, various artworks that experimented with the interaction between the viewer and the artwork by applying feedback and computer systems were also presented, showing an ambivalent attitude towards technology. As such, although temp contemporary art tends not to readily accept technological media, the symbiosis of computer technology and humans is both an unavoidable reality and a task for all of us. And in the 21st century technological environment, technology is used more actively as a medium of art. I believe that technology not only expands the formative possibilities of various arts, but also makes a positive contribution to the role of art as communication. As to the first question regarding the open perspective toward human autonomy from technology, I would like to answer the question in connection with the discussion of interactivity. I believe the discussion of the interactivity between humans and technology is related to whether the relationship between humans and technological other is possible. Interactivity is an important aspect of art that embraces technology. Art uses advanced technology, but technology cannot determine how art exists, what it means, or how we enjoy it. I think it is important to perceive technology as a human collaborator rather than being buried in the power of highly advanced technology or allowing technology to determine the way or breadth of a human experience. In the interactive art that was presented in connection with the cybernetics concept and telematic art, the artist gives free will to the audience and the artwork to act freely rather than controlling them. In other words, the artist gives the viewer the freedom to explore the artist's imaginary world as well as the will to discover or miss the wonders that can be found in that imaginary world. Therefore, artworks are no longer presented unilaterally to the viewer as a perfect object for meditating on their everlasting aesthetic values. Rather, the work of art is presented as an entity that interacts with the viewer in the context in which the work is produced and placed. Therefore, the interaction between the viewer and the work has become a major factor in shaping the meaning of the work. In this way, it serves as an important turning point for the viewer to break away from the traditional or modernist way of presenting the meaning of the work decided by the artist to the viewer and to participate as a subject who creatively shapes the meaning of the work while finding the meaning in the relationship with the work. We might be able to say that this turning point expands Roland Barthes' discussion, which discussed the death of the author and the birth of a reader. And we can see another important point, which can serve as a turning point where a reader or a divided author or artist is born. In the second question, the discussant said a new social market has been created where artworks are traded with virtual currencies such as NFTs, and this shows that art is advancing in a completely different direction from where it is now thanks to technology. This is not debatable at all. Art that embraces digital and information technology is very different from traditional art. 
In other words, there has been a fundamental change in the way artworks exist, how they are displayed and distributed, and how they are appreciated and enjoyed. Facing these challenges and changes, we need to recognize and understand that the traditional art and the new art are fundamentally different in the way they it, that works exist, are produced, appreciated, and distributed. We need to perceive this new art that embraces technology in a whole new way, and if we approach this as if it is the same as the traditional art, we would fail to understand and respond to it properly. This new art embracing technology has the potential to expand our sensibilities and emotions. Various art forms that embrace information and communications technology shown as seen in telematic art with the potential to overcome the temporal and spatial limitations may change the experience of time and space that we have had so far. And when invisible electricity is used as a medium, it is possible to break down the limitations of artworks that have been created within the material limits. This will open various possibilities as to the way an artwork exists. Once again, I would like to thank the discussant for his insightful and inspiring questions. I hope this answers his questions. Thank you. The second session will discuss the role of art from a technical and aesthetic point of view. The presentation will be delivered by Professor Sung Chul Shin. Professor Sung Chul Shin is an image scholar and professor at Gangneung Wangju National University. He received his PhD in philosophy from Humboldt University in Berlin. He worked at the Humboldt Higher Institute for Image Content or Behavior, and his books include From from similar chrome to visual being, the idealism of virtual art. Today's presentation has an interesting title, Techni, purely illuminating without pushing to heart. Let's listen to the professor's presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Sun Chol Shin from Gangneung Wangju National University. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Tae Kim of the Korean Society of Media and Arts and Artistic Director Song Ho Kim for having me on this meaningful occasion. I was asked to address the role of art as technique from a technical and aesthetic point of view, time-wise. I would like to briefly touch upon the modern technology culture and introduce Heidegger's critique claiming the recovery of the ancient Greek concept of techne. You can see the sketch by Leonardo da Vinci, the two rain is falling from the sky, tools like hammers, chisels, and spanners are falling from the sky. The overall atmosphere is not bright as the tools are randomly falling. Da Vinci's writing at the bottom of the painting makes it even gloomier. To paraphrase, it means, oh human suffering, how you have enslaved yourself to so many things only for the sake of money. Here, he criticizes human greed for creating an uncomfortable relationship with nature and causing suffering. Ever since their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, humans have used technology to survive in a hostile nature covered in thorns and thistles. Only by the sweat of the brow, man could survive. However, looking back on today's natural ecological environment, it seems that the relationship between technology and nature has not been as harmonious as we want. 
wanted. From the perspective of men, you have to do painful labor to survive. In the eyes of nature, greed of man has gone to fall. This is the book, The Judgment of Jupiter. This book features such a conflict in quite an interesting way. This German classic is about nature suing humans and the conflict Conflict and tension between the two is played out in Jupiter's court. In the picture, you can see a woman on the left with a ripped dress. This is nature. On the other side, a minor with a tool that is a human appears as the defendant. The figure below the woman is Mercury, the lawyer of nature. Mercury argues, nature has provided man with everything he needs, and man became too greedy and cut her intestines, destroyed the entire body and depleted the energy. It is as if looking straight into our eyes and talking to us. In fact, the act of destroying nature has continued since the advent of the humanity. On the other hand, the man claims as follows, Nature, you have hidden everything good and expensive, so we have to dig harder and farther. So nature, which causes hard work and excessive labor, is nothing more than a stepmother. Jupiter, who sits in front at the center of the picture or at the top seat of the courtroom, makes a ruling. Men will keep digging up mountains, making mines, and clearing fields, no matter what, and the consequence will be toil crisis and death. In other words, the verdict was interested to the God is the fate that is Fortuna. Men was made responsible for the consequences of their actions. With the advances in civilization, especially since the Renaissance, humans seem to have developed a strong confidence in technological civilization. Leonardo da Vinci warned of human greed, but indicated that various tools are from heaven. If you look at Benvenuto Cellini's sketch on the left, you can see that the alphabet and various tools are arranged in an orderly manner under Diana, who nourishes all things. The people in the era of the Renaissance are saying human technology came from nature. That is why technological civilization does not create conflict. Rather, it gives harmonious order to a barren environment. Such a belief is also confirmed in Hemskirk's print in 1572. If you look at the picture, Diana with multiple breasts is feeding a human. On the left, under the globus, made of various tools, idyllic nature, and a peaceful city are presented. Since the Renaissance, man seems to have been strongly convinced of Aristotle's definition of art. Art completes what nature has not finished and imitates it. As all of you know, the ancient Greeks did not have the word art. Instead, they used the term techne to cover technology and art all at the same time. In this way, Aristotle's definition of art can be easily applied to the term technology. From this comes the confidence that technology is part of nature that comes from nature, and that by giving it harmony, we can create utopia. In this context, Francis Bacon divides nature into three different categories. The first is nature created by God and operating according to his principle. Second, nature that deviates from its path and undergoes alterations such as a bizarre natural phenomenon or mutation. And finally, nature that has been artificially changed and altered by humans. All three are included in the history of nature. This concept of natural history is clearly seen in Francis Bacon's novel Utopia. As you well know, this novel begins with a scene where the main character who has drifted 
Ted from South Pacific accidentally arrives on an island where Utopia is embodied. In the novel, the ideal world Utopia is described in detail. Among them, a park with all kinds of animals and birds appears. You can think of it as a park where animals whose skin color or shape have been changed by human experiments or new species created through cross-breeding are gathered. In introducing these bizarre animals, Bacon actively defends the work of technology that explores the principles of nature and alters things for human purposes. So he was so convinced that technology produces utopia. This painting is the form by Alexis Brockman. In this work, you can see how the utopia that Bacon envisioned 500 years ago is realized. Against the background of a well-organized soybean field, things like fatless chickens with multiple wings, genetically modified cows, and colorful ornamental birds are introduced. The story in the novel has become a reality. You might think of the scene as something of the near future, However, the creatures appearing here have become a reality long, long time ago. To take some example, this kind of fat cow is very familiar to us. Cows and pigs in their natural state must have been very small in size, but through breeding and crossbreeding and a genetic modification, they've grown to this size. This is a hairless chicken developed by Israeli researchers. If you look at Rockman's work, you can see the evolution of chickens into a hairless, multi-winged poultry, just as cows enlarged for meat. They are genetically modified to make it easier for us to cook and eat hot wings and honey combos. The square-shaped watermelon on the bottom right has been commercialized long ago. You are also familiar with this gene-modified mouse in the bottom. It is the starting point for tissue engineering, but it is also uh, the revelation how animals in the laboratory are sacrificed for a human agenda. Considering all these, we come to ask whether the park that Bacon envisioned was really a utopia, and whether his overconfidence in technological civilization was right. This painting, a collection of lives created by humans, also conveys a very very strange, bizarre feeling. If you come to face with these deformed creatures, you will feel even more uncomfortable. Other than the natural mutations, the creatures you've just seen are those born in Chernobyl and Fukushima. This is the case in point where one can see the adverse effects of humans on nature. It would be needless to talk any further about the impact of human technology or technological civilization on nature. The suffering of nature captured in the German classic continues to this day. The well-known Anthropocene discourse also emerges from this. Humanity's impact on the global environment is unprecedented. This will again in turn affect us. So, are we creating a utopia right now? Unlike the Renaissance, most of us will probably give a negative answer to this question. Martin Heidegger believed that the issues arising from technological civilization should be resolved through a critical thinking on the concept of technology. Heidegger witnessed the destruction of nature as Germany's economy developed rapidly after World War II. What we call the miracle of the Rhine from this, he started his critical thinking on technology. 
For Heidegger, the fundamental problem of technology stems from us exploiting nature. Let me take an example. Cultivation of the past, according to Heidegger, was to grow and care for the land that is not to demand something from the farmland, but to sow the seed, let it sprout, and take good care of it to grow well. Whereas, Modern cultivation becomes part of the food industry, driving nature with all sorts of technologies to increase productivity. Heidegger expressed his deep concern not only over this, but also over the construction of dams and hydroelectric power plants here and there. It means that they are grilling nature to give more for human purposes. As a result, that the relationship between humans and nature is becoming more and more distorted. Heidegger criticized technology that drives and pushes nature hard and ponders on what technology was in the first place. In fact, technology as we know it is rather simple as a concept. It is a means to obtain something from nature. Heidegger calls this the instrumental anthropological definition of technology. He also warns that with such a simplistic approach to technology, we will miss out on its essence. This is how Heidegger defines technology. Technology is not just a means, but an activity that creates or re reveals something. That is, a gentle activity turning a state of inexistence into a state of existence. The ancient Greeks called this activity poiesis. Today, the meaning of the term still remains in the word poetry. While composing or reading poetry, we experience a certain object in a new way. Heidegger likewise believed that technology was associated with the revealing of truth in a poetic way. To quote Heidegger, technology is an activity that opens up what is there. Here, Heidegger emphasizes the fact that the ancient Greeks used the term techne to refer to technology. As mentioned earlier, the ancient Greeks used the word techne to refer to both technology and art. In other words, the distinction between the two, at least to the ancient Greeks, was not clear, which means that art had a technological nature and technology had an artistic nature. Heidegger defines art as events of truth that reveal something hidden, arguing that technology you must restore this artistic nature. Technology should not remain as a means to attack nature, but a new relationship with nature should be formed through the artistic nature of exploring its essence. Contemporary artists seem to have already embodied Heidegger's request in an artistic way. For instance, Agnes Dennis, in the early 1980s, carried out a project where seeds were planted and crops were harvested in a landfill in Manhattan where one can see Wall Street. Considering the economic value of the land, it was absurd. Furthermore, no attempt was made to make up for the loss by increasing production. The artist manages the growth of seeds only while remaining irrelevant to the things such as numbers and speed. And through this, the artist critically addresses the ecological environment and energy issues. William Kentridge's drawing highlights the same point. Kentridge finds an account book in an abandoned mine office and starts drawing on it. It depicts a desolate nature that has been dug up and abandoned by humans. 
Here, Cantridge becomes critical of the accounting books that convert not just resources but also the humans who work there into numbers and money. With this, the artist reveals the inhumane money economy and the evils of our technological civilization, which has come to faster and exploit even humans. There would be many other examples. All of these works respond to high degrees request in that they both ask questions about technological civilization and trigger critical thinking about it. Heidegger poses a serious question about the nature of technology in the face of the issues that have been created. Technology has harshly pushed nature. He highlighted that technology is not a means we exercise recklessly, but part of artistic activity that gently illuminates existence and reveals its essence. And to discover such nature of technology, we should keep asking questions, Heidegger advises, because the more you think while asking questions, the more mysterious the essence of techne you will discover. We are experiencing even more severe environmental crisis than Heidegger's day. We need to heed to this advice because thinking about technology will certainly protect the natural environment and ourselves from the recklessness that we built. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation. In closing, I would like to quote Heidegger, who calls for a careful thought and reflection on technological civilization, we want to ask questions about technology and build a free relationship with technology through it. Relationship is free when it opens our the same to the essence of technology. The essence of technology refers to techne or artistic nature. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful presentation. Although the discussion started from the role of art as techne, in the end, by taking the concept of techne, a common concept for the separation of art and technology, it is suggested that thinking about technology gently illuminates its existence and restores the nature of art as a technology that shows its essence. The presentation was truly impressive. I also deeply sympathize with the saying that careful thinking is needed rather than optimism about technological civilization. We will turn to the discussion by artist Chen Sai Hua Kwan. Chen Sai Hua Kwan is a co-founder of Goma Space, a Singapore-based independent air, air art space. He interprets everyday life and living experiences that are often overlooked with his site contextualized works, including installation, sculpture, sound, film, and drawing. Hi, Sun Chushin. Um, thank you for your pr presentation, very inspiring. I have a few questions for you, hope you can elaborate based on them. Japanese artist group Exonimos um, work keys or dual project monitor consists of two LED monitor uh, hanging mid-air, display the face of people arranged in a way they are kissing. The installation used a massive number of cables um, that reinforce a, the reality of modern technology as its physical substance become increasingly increasing visible that we often ignore them. But in reality, they are an integrated part of our existence. In, our, in, in your view, can Martin Hedegel's idea of gesture, gestel, be used in decontextualize the relation between people and technology in keys or dual monitor? And this posed my second question on Chinese contemporary art painter Liu Xiaotong has created a painting machine to process rolling image feeds and translate the ever-changing flow of people into complex network of abstract mark on canvas resulting in a body machine manufactured painting. He titled the outcome of the painting as the weight of insomnia. In the idea of 
Porris, in which a person brings something into being that did not exist before. Do you think Liu's actions of creating machine painting is producing Porris? <coughs> Um, that goes for my third question. In your presentation, you have discussed how the nature is being mutated about the for the interest of human consumption. I would like to refer to practice of Cypress Bond, Australian st stalactite. You may have heard of his work before. His most controversial artwork is to attach a cell cultivated years to his left arm exploring the technology extension of the human body although he called this the an exploration of alternate atomic architecture what would you like to respond to the artistic idea of construction a soft porous to on the human body thank you First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Chen Sai Hua Kwan for his interesting comment on my presentation. My presentation was focused on introducing Heidegger's reasoning for asking questions about the nature of technology in response to the problems generated by technology culture. You have provided me an opportunity to consider Heidegger's thoughts through artworks by asking various questions from an artist point of view. In particular, the examples of contemporary art are very meaningful in relation to Heidegger's call for the restoration of the concept of techne, that is, technology, to awaken the artistic nature. I would like to answer the three questions posed one by one. The first question, to my understanding, was about the impact of increasingly invisible technology. You took the work of the Japanese artist group Exonemo as an example, so I will give you an answer while looking at the picture. This work reveals our reality and paradox. For example, we can't see even a single wire on our smartphones. However, the communications system is supported by a very complex and massive communications network. In addition to that, there are numerous 5G devices and equipment. There is extensive new coverage, news coverage on security issues, economic issues, hedge money, and the rising tension between the United States and China in relation to that. In that sense, the expression gestel seems to be applicable to the relationship between humans and technology. Heidegger described gestel as an extreme danger to humans, that is, it makes man no longer able to face himself or with his essence. In Ixonimo's work, the two characters on the LCD monitors look quite romantic and a bit bizarre in some ways. And that is also related to Gestalt, where it becomes difficult for humans to come to face to face with who they really are. But in this pessimistic situation, Heidegger recites Feldlin's verse that goes, where there is danger, however, the power of salvation also grows. So Heidegger believed that by turning technology into the issue of techne and breaking away from concealment of as art does, we can break free from the reality where technological devices and equipment are eating into humans. Simply put, it is important to allow humans to experience their existence by contemplating the nature of technology. In this context, Heidegger introduces one more line of Feldlin's verse. Humans live poetically on Earth. Technological devices and mechanical devices are becoming more invisible. One can say that it is almost virtual in a way, but it will be more closely connected or combined with our bodies. 
but it would not be possible for technological devices to eat into our substance, as Heidegger pointed out, as long as we keep in mind Heidegger's call for poetic discovery. The second question is about the concept of uh, poesis through the painting practice of Chinese artist Liu Xiaodong. As you can see in the picture, it is a machine, not a human, who is drawing in this work. However, I view this as a return to the past, not the future of painting. In other words, it is a return to the traditional media called canvas. The artist is revealing the entire process of making this work, just like Picasso, who revealed how he made his work. However, the information processing process was used to make the machine draw the picture. In fact, before humans, nature created beautiful landscape and objects. Likewise, after humans, I don't know if I could say it like this, machines will also paint. What is important here is both nature and human mach and machines are performing the activity called poiesis. So I think that the practice of art is possible for anything, anyone, whether it is nature, humans, machines, or anyone else. However, from Heidegger's point of view, the production activity called poiesis is also creative imitation, that is, the process of revealing the essence of existence. Considering this, Liu Xiaolong's work does not seem to deviate much from Heidegger's definition as it explores the essence of painting. The third question is about Stylox's added ear. In answering your first question, I briefly touched upon the combination of humans and technology or something like body and machine, but Stylox's bizarre body seems to be visualizing this in its extreme. In fact, it seems that this work has prompted ethical issues more due to its intense and bizarre visual expression than to the message of the work. So I think we need to look more carefully at the context of the artist certain artistic practices. When referring to this work, Stalmach made it clear that his purpose was not to create an ear-shaped structure, and as Chen Sai Huaquan stated, the purpose of this work lies in the creation of an alternative anatomical architecture. In other words, a new organ that is accessible to and shared with people in different places. Personally, I once dealt with this work extensively in my book on bioart. It seems to me that the key to this work is the Bluetooth microphone. At the time of surgery to insert the ear-shaped piece, a Bluetooth microphone was put in together. Stalock said he was trying to connect the microphone to the internet so that everyone could hear the sounds of his surroundings. He conducted real experiment and succeeded. However, it had some side effects, so it was removed immediately. By making another ear on his arm, Salak gave away his ear for all, or gave up his ear for all. I describe this as a kind of sharing economy in my book. This might be an exaggeration or even blasphemous that an artist gave up his body or organs to everyone just as Christ gave his body. The point is that Salak explored in an artistic way the essence of the human body and organs and furthermore, the essence of what we call human beings. In this respect, I think that it is an artistic practice that creatively embodies Heidegger's thinking about technology as a techne. It is all I have. I would also like to thank the discussant who gave interesting comments and all the participants for their time and attention. Thank you. 
This addition of Kangwon International Triennial especially places importance on the revitalization of everyday life and a local community through art. As technology ecology, daily life and local community were selected as the exhibition of them, the venues where exhibitions and events are held also extensively used the daily space from the past. This session intends to discuss daily life and ecotechnic from a cultural critical point of view. In particular, Mark Zapta Kazmier Zak, an independent curator from Poland and the United States, discusses efforts and concerns about how the art scene can practice eco friendly technology and art, that is, eco technique, to maintain daily revitalization and environmental sustainability. Malgozata Kazmir Zak served as editor in chief of arts and documentation journal and director of the College City Art Gallery and is currently an assistant faster at the Krakow National uh, University of Education and vice president of ICA International and ICA Poland. Hello, my name is Malgozata Kazmir Zak, and today I will talk about the museums and the art of environmental sustainability. Um, in September 2015, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that includes 17 Sustainable Development Goals, um, often abbreviated as um, SDGs. These are, um, as you can see on the chart, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, uh, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice and strong institutions, and finally, partnerships to achieve the goals. Um, Museums all around the world, as public institutions acting for the good of communities, started to include these goals um, in their mission statements. In the National Council of Museums General Assembly at the General Conference in Kyoto in 2019 adopted the resolution Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and established a working group devoted to sustainability. Uh, the network of European museum organizations also put the sustainability in their agenda and organizes webinars to help museums achieve their goals. Of course, some of these goals are easier to fulfill for museums than others. Uh, for example, through organizing exhibitions and educating society about the sustainability or undertaking partnerships with other institutions. Um, some require changes in work culture um, of the institution, for example, equal pay, stable working conditions, uh, etc. Some refer to the changes in the language used um, to make it more uh, inclusive. Museums are the large part of our everyday life um, and therefore I decided to focus on the technologies used in order to improve the energy use of buildings, increase proportion of renewable uh, energy and reduce waste of all kinds. It is worth mentioning that um, in 2017 uh, when Donald Trump delivered an official notice to the United Nations that the United States, the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases, intended to withdraw from the Paris Agreement on Climate Change as soon as the USA was eligible to do so. Um, museums, zoos, gardens, aquariums and historic sites then joined Micah Bloomberg's initiative We Are Still In and took a stand using the um, Museums for Paris hashtag on Twitter. The hashtag was the idea of Sarah Sutton uh, the principal of Sustainable Museums and co-author of the Green Museum, a primer on environmental uh, practice. Uh, why is this so important for the cultural institutions that adhere to these ideals? Um, as stated in the text, Museums and the Future of Healthy World, Just, Verdant and Peaceful, Museums hold in one body the diverse physical and intellectual resources, abilities, creativity, freedom and authority to foster the changes the world needs most. Studies show that the museums are also very trusted institutions and therefore it is very important that they take education mission. American Alliance of Museums in 2014 started the Sustainability Excellence Awards as a signature program of the Environment and Climate Network that educates, facilitates and encourages green practices in museums. Other countries have their own eco badges. Um, the common international measure for this is the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, LEED, 
uh, certification. One of the most spectacular uh, examples of uh, architecture can be found in the California Academy of Science, uh, San Francisco. Uh, naturally integrated into the landscape, the center has a 10,000 square meter roof covered by 1.7 million native plants that act as a thermal insulator reducing the building's energy needs while absorbing 13 mil million liters of water per year, most of which uh, are used for museum purposes. The roof is also bursting with native plants uh, that provide an environment for birds and insects. In fact, according to the Academy's website, uh, the living roof acts as the densest concentration of native wildflowers in San Francisco, that which attracts attention to the issue of biodiversity also. Um, the structure built to house the academy, designed by Renzo Piano, opened in 2008. This followed a period of construction in which 90% of the demolition materials were recycled to help local projects, such as dune restoration and roadway construction. To minimize environmental impact for the duration of the project, eco-friendly materials were sourced, such as recycled denim for insulation, recycled byproducts of coal combustion and metal extraction for concrete, and lumber for sustainable yield harvests. The building consumes 30% less electric electricity than any building of its size, and uh, 60,000 photovoltaic cells generate almost 213,000 kilowatt hours per year, which covers around 5% of its energy needs and prevents the release of more than 202 tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. Uh, energy is saved throughout the building in many ways. Uh, for example, sensor faucets in the bathrooms charge themselves with EGUs. Flowing water causes an internal turbine to generate power and charge the battery park. Heat recovery systems capture and utilize heat produced by HVAC systems. Um, wherever possible, natural light is used uh, thanks to uh, floor-to-ceiling glass made with low iron content for better um, clarity. The glass also absorbs heat, minimizing energy used for cooling. Openable windows are used in 90% of regularly occupied spaces, such as museum's offices, have access to daylight. Uh, on the museum's main public floor, an automated ventilation system uses natural air currents of Golden Gate Park and to regulate temperature inside the building. Louvers on all four sides of the building open and close, cooling it with fresh air, so the building does not rely on HVAC systems uh, or chemical cooling. Radiant floor heating is used with tubes embedded in concrete, uh, which reduces the energy needs by 10% in comparison with traditional forced air heating system. Uh, the California Academy of Sciences has received the information prestigious LED double platinum uh, certification. Um, other sustainable uh, centers have uh, also been created in recent years, such as the Futuristic Museum of Tomorrow in Rio de Janeiro, designed by Santiago Calatrava. Inaugurated in 2015, the center consumes 40% less energy than a conventional building, and its cooling system uses water from uh, nearby Guanabara Bay. Um, its solar panels move with the sun to maximize energy absorption, and reusable rainwater is collected. This water is then filtered, cleaned, and returned back uh, to the bay through a small waterfall. Uh, all of the uh, water in the museums, wash basins, sinks and showers is treated and recycled, along with uh, the water used to dehumidify the air, uh, which can reach up to 4,000 liters of water per, per day. These efforts save an estimated 9.6 million liters of water and 2,400 megawatt hours of electricity each year, enough to sustain over 1,200 homes. Um, most often, eco-technologies need to be used in existing buildings. Iberdrola, the Spanish electric utility company, through its foundation in Spain, sponsored the installation of a new lighting system, incorporating LED technology in the Museo del Prado. Um, this solution will allow an annual energy saving of 95, uh, 5, 79.5% and will avoid the emission of 320 tons of uh, CO2 each year. The National Museum of Art in Mexico City underwent a similar innovation thanks to Ibedrola, Mexico. Um, of course, another issue are sustainable exhibitions. And just recently, in June 2021, there was an exhibition in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Busan entitled Sustainable Museum Art and Environment, which discussed the environmental impact of exhibitions. As stated by the curator, the decision was inspired by the fundamental fact that the resource-intensive spectacles have not properly dealt with the issue of sustainability. For example, as we further read in the exhibition materials, uh, the transportation of six artworks from New York City to Busan by air generates almost 16 tons of carbon dioxide. 
Uh, the same transportation by sea emits one fortieth of the carbon dioxide, but this, by, but this way is less preferable by museums. Carol Hammond elaborated on this topic in her article, The Eco Museum Reimagining Exhibition Production, appealing not to use toxic paints, uh, PVC, and other carcinogenic materials, as suggested dividing um, the materials used for exhibitions into green, gray, and black lists as a guide for curator, uh, curators and museum management. Um, institutions also need to th start thinking about uh, reusable parts of the exhibition architecture and scenography, such as is a common practice in theaters in Poland. Um, responsibility here lies also on artists themselves, uh, who should consider the carbon footprint, water use, etc., of their artworks. So in my view, um, giant plastic uh, installations, such as uh, Ludwika Ogozelec in the Center of Contemporary Art Yususki Castle in Warsaw, uh, or the printouts um, of Leonardo da Vinci Last Supper uh, in the National Museum of Warsaw should never come into being. One should also critically look at the works of artists such as Cristo or Kaiwa uh, Cheng, although the latter recently declared that he tried to use um, more eco-friendly fireworks. According to my brief research, museums are not eager uh, to undertake the necessary changes, even on the human level or work culture. Uh, some of these changes, such as the limitation in paper use or um, renovations which require public contracts, are connected with legal and bureaucratic issues, uh, which was also pointed out by Isabella Luisa Pop and Anka Borsa, uh, who wrote about the situation in Romania, uh, which can be prob probably, however, applied to all East Eastern Europe. In early November 2020, artists, researchers and directors of leading museums in Germany including uh, the Museum Ludwig in Cologne, uh, Hamburger Kunsthalle and uh, Kunsthalle Düsseldorf wrote an open letter to Monika Grieters, Germany's uh, Minister of State for Culture. They call for the creation of a task force that would advise museums, formulate goals and come up with measures for a more sustainable public art sector. Uh, museums Ludwig, Ludwig's uh, director, Yilmaz uh, Jewe, complained that they face many bureaucratic hurdles whenever they want to make any positive change. At the same time, Stefan Simon, director of the Radger Research Laboratory at the National Museums in Berlin, and one of the letter's signatories, said, um, For many museum directors, climate change and climate protection are very far removed from reality of their daily challenges, as if they were happening in another planet, which proves that there is a lot to do in that matter. Um, to summarize, let me finish with a short WWF campaign the Museo del Prado was engaged in. Mm, and let it be a warning campaign for all of us engaged in the museum production and institutional uh, critique. Thank you. For introducing us to the evolving standards of sustainability and the efforts of pioneering art institutions in response to them. In particular, environmental issues that may arise from the transfer or transportation of artworks or production materials during the course of the exhibition seem to be a problem that is so close to me as an artist. In this regard, Jan Yano Kim, the CEO of the Alternative Visual Cultural Factory, Igo, will ask questions. Jan Yano Kim is currently a visiting professor at Seoul International Alternative Visual Art Festival Art Center and Korean National University of Art. She is conducting various studies and curate creations on the topographical map of Korea's alternative visual arts. Greetings. 
I'm Jen Yeonho Kim Jung. I would like to ask some questions on museums and the art of environmental sustainability by Mago Zata Kazmierzak. I think that curator Mago Zata Kazmierzak's presentation is significant as she suggested the need to apply the eco tech concept to exhibitions as well as elaborating on why we need the eco tech concept through the example of museums that apply the concept. As the presenter mentioned, energy efficiency and circularity should be preceded by the coexistence with nature and the creation of a sustainable environment and be appropriated for everyday practice. So my first question is, the museums the presenter is introduced are all excellent museums deploying the concept of eco-tech and introducing eco-friendly energy production, saving and conservation in the right place in response to the climate change. I believe that as the viewers would become more familiarized with sustainability and eco-friendliness for the coexistence of nature and humans if they view artworks in such a space. Yet I believe there are three considerations in introducing and putting into practice the eco tech concept in a museum. First of all, I think that applying the eco tech concept into a museum might be something that can be proposed when building a new museum because in order to deploy the eco tech concept in the existing museum, the existing building would have to be torn down or renovated consuming a huge amount of a budget and generating a considerable amount of waste. Second, as each museum building has different conditions, how we practice the eco-tech concept could differ depending on buildings, construction materials, art materials, and exhibitions. The third is the budget required to realize the eco-tech concept. Sufficiently budgeted countries or museums can build sustainable museums, but many countries do not have such a budget. I'd like to ask the presenter to share the most basic level of eco-tech practice that can be applied to various environments accounting for the three considerations I just specified. Turning to the second question, I have created film festivals, exhibitions, and public art products that primarily engage video media in Korea. This year, I created a village shop museum project which featured works of visual art using stores in a village. This is a public art project that utilized the windows of those stores for citizens who cannot go to the museum due to COVID-19. This project was also aimed at not generating waste from public art as much as possible. As the presenter mentioned, the waste on exhibition leaves is a very serious problem. If we gather all the waste from exhibitions at museums across the globe, we will have a huge rubbish mountain. Fake walls which are set up at every exhibition, toxic paints, PVC, and other carcinogenic materials are used and discarded as customary practices. Poly art works too also turn into a huge pile of garbage when exhibition is over. Therefore, I believe that the art scene needs to take the initiative in making efforts toward that direction. Would you please share any eco-tech practices or guidelines that can be incorporated into the day-to-day -day lives of curators? Thank you. Okay, so to answer your first question, um, I think the real problem is when the new museum buildings are constructed in a non-sustainable way. So the example that I have here in my city uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Krakow was opened in 2011 and just during the opening it turned out that they used um, wrong materials. Uh, they used glass floor that cracked even before the opening and it turned out that, the, that everything is managed by computers so it means that they had to have 300 servers working non-stop uh, which in turn required uh, a conditioning system to be turned 24-7 so I think this is the real disgrace and um, when we think about both new, old and uh, new museum spaces, we should think about adopting passive solar design, uh, use of uh, renewable energy sources, solar, wind power, the use of collected rainwater, 
um, treat and reuse grey water. And um, you're completely right that when you uh, say that about the usage of old buildings, because the um, the demolition of buildings uh, should be the last resort. Yeah, only when it's not economical or practical to reuse, to adapt or uh, extend existing ones because it's the, the most energy in the world is used for uh, building new uh, buildings. We can also think about planting evergreen trees to create microclimates uh, in winter and summer. We also have to think about life cycle costs of products associated with construction, operation, maintenance and disposal, as well as the efficient use of resources and maximizing use of local materials. So I give you the example of Museo del Prado as an existing space which managed to change their lightning system uh, thanks to a sponsor. And I think this is the type of investment that just needs to be done. Uh, just like the changes in architecture uh, so that the buildings are accessible for people with disabilities. It was a law in the um, uh, European Union and it just had to be done. And now in Poland, every one family building owner installs photovoltaic cells on the roof uh, thanks to the European Union help. Uh, but I don't see public institutions doing this. And we need, we need public programs that would facilitate um, these changes in adopting green energies. It's just a responsibility of the state or the owner of the site of the museum. And as for less developed, poor countries uh, that you mentioned, I think in general they tend to be less, um, use less waste, less energy. Uh, they base on traditional media more. Um, they recycle or reuse more. Uh, they don't borrow artworks from overseas. Um, so, in general, they are more eco than institutions in richer countries, exactly for economic reasons. And I know museums, even in Poland, uh, in which they turn off the lights, TVs, screens, everything, when there is nobody in the room, and uh, when there is no AC system, so they are completely eco. And um, uh, while build, buying products and services, uh, when we run the museum, we need to assess the, their life cycle. We need to also investigate the claims of green products because there's a lot of greenwashing in this business. We can choose suppliers who take back packaging for reuse or purchase packaging that can be recycled. We can find a supply of paper with maximum recycled content. We can save paper by not printing everything and by mm, printing double-sided. We can use refillable toner cartridges uh, for printers, etc. Uh, we can also promote walking, biking or using public transportation by giving people who get to our institution in one of these ways discounts to enter our museum. And we can stop serving meat or ideally all animal derived products and alcohol in uh, museum cafeterias. Now for your second question, I think like I partially, uh, uh, partially um, answered it in the first question, but unfortunately there is no manual for curators of visual arts uh, or none that I'm aware of, uh, and I'm sure it's the, the very soon there's not going to be one because um, it's a very important topic. But there is one for event organizers, published by uh, Fédération Equestre Internationale, it's a Swiss organization, FEI, and it's available online. It's called Sustainability Handbook for Event Organizers um, by FEI, you can Google it. And it's more, it more or less applies to the problems all curators uh, of visual arts also come across. So I would send you to this book because this topic is very complex and we don't have uh, enough time to answer all of these uh, detailed um, topics. Thank you. So far, and we have had three presenters and discussants, and we've looked into the relationship between art and technology and the restoration of the environment and daily life, as well as the efforts for sustainability. This time, we will invite Ms. Kim Levin, Honorary President of ICA International, to discuss examples of artistic practices in the Anthropocene era. Ms. Kim Levin is also so a chairman emeritus of ICA International, and she has been an independent art creator and curator for the past two decades, and she has been a regular contributor to various art magazines. She served as an advisor for the first World Biennial in 1995 and commissioner for the Busan Biennial in 2002. She has written various books, and she would like to uh, present her presentation on the artistic practices as well as the life of Agnes Dennis. Hello, colleagues. Uh, my lecture is called Agnes Dennis and the Anthropocene, 
a textual criticism of the universe. Working with a paradox, defining the elusive, visualizing the invisible, communicating the incommunicable, not accepting the limitations society has imposed, seeing in new ways, living for a fraction of a second and penetrating light years, using intellect and instinct to achieve intuition, measuring time in the extreme distances, desiring to know the importance or insignificance of existence." Unquote. In 1969, Agnes Dennis's manifesto was unique. It seemed too philosophical, too scientific, and too mystical for those rebellious post-minimal times. Above all, it was very challenging. So little understood back then, her prophetic vision encompassed all the paradoxes of the human condition. It certainly wasn't obsessed with the literal, the way much radical American art was at that time. It wasn't concerned with practical matters, the way, for example, the works of Merle Laterman O'Kelly's were. O'Kelly's, would, who would become artist in residence at the New York Sanitation Department, issued a manifesto that same year that began with a demand, quote, after the revolution, who's going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning, unquote. Agnes Dennis had more crucial concerns. Her manifesto was unapologetically existential. But then as a child in wartime, Nazi-occupied Budapest. Dennis spent most of World War II in an air raid shelter. She was raised in Sweden and educated in the United States. In 1969, Dennis created a work titled Human Dust. It consists of an unadorned glass bowl piled high with human ashes, perched on a plinth. On the wall next to it is a typed text that gives the objective statistics of the life of the unknown man whose ashes they are, right down to exactly how many breaths he breathed in his finite days on Earth. Dennis's human dust is not only an excruciatingly objective portrait of a human being, but also an indirect challenge to a male conceptual artist who had made an iconic work of conceptual art in 1965. Joseph Katsuth's One and Three Chairs questioned an object, an actual chair, and its visual and verbal codes a photograph of a chair, a dictionary definition. At that time, Dennis's work tended to be dismissed, if only because it was by a woman. Between 1969 and 1975, Dennis was also translating the Bible into Morse code, pitting a humanistic ideal against the possibility of a divine cosmic purpose. She was exploring the role of sound. Quote, I seek the invisible, inaudible, and unknown, unquote. In addition, she started work on the Book of Dust in 1969. Published in 1989, it records those two decades of her work. Quote, dust is the beginning and the end the essence of existence, unquote. Her pioneering projects utilize science, philosophy, linguistics, psychology, mathematics, trigonometry, ecology, and her wicked wit. Visualizing the logic of systems, 
both informational and societal, her projects manage to explore various systems of knowledge. Along with their existential content, her use of materials has also been exploratory. She created one of the first holographic artworks ever. X-rayed flora, fauna, and skeletons, and investigated everything from mathematical structures to analytical thoughts as ways to map what it means to be human. Shortly before the COVID pandemic put everything on pause, Agnes Dennis began to receive the major recognition her work deserved. She had long been a highly admired artist, but the scope of her work was much more comprehensive than most people knew. She had been in several documentaries and Venice Biennales. Long before that, she had been one of only three women artists to be included in the legendary 1970 Software Information Exhibition that introduced New Yorkers to conceptual art. She co-founded the Women's Cooperative Air Gallery. More recently, her 30-foot tall living pyramid of grasses and wildflowers was a highlight at Socrates Sculpture Park. But still, at the beginning of 2020, her career-spanning retrospective at The Shed in Manhattan's Hudson Yards, titled Absolutes and Intermediates, was an astonishing revelation. It featured over 150 works spanning her 50-year career. The scope of her art could finally be seen in a breathtaking exhibition. Her visionary works had long been compared to those of Leonardo da Vinci, yet they are far more relevant to our present moment than we could ever have imagined. Her conceptual projects surpass in scope the works of better known male conceptualists. Her environmental projects exceed those of Robert Smithson, whose art was based on entropy, and Joseph Boyce, who sought universal creativity. Her works engage with the world in myriad ways, acknowledging the destructions of the Anthropocene and challenging all limitations. Back in the 70s, the art historian Lawrence Alloway summed up her work, quote, Dennis's art is like a textual criticism of the universe. Hans Ulrich Obrist in the catalog for the Shed retrospective wote Agnes Dennis not only anticipated the man-made destruction of natural habitats at a moment when few people were paying attention, but much of her work features solutions to ecological crises we are now facing. Agnes Dennis's earthworks aren't simply formal constructions. She didn't seek out a distant salt lake or extinct volcano to be seen only by intrepid travelers. And when the time came to harvest wheat field, a confrontation, oh, I skipped some, sorry. Uh, in 1982, she planted a wheat field in the heart of Manhattan. With a team of volunteers, she added many truckloads of dirt to what was then the Battery Park landfill. She dug 285 furrows by hand and planted two acres of red spring wheat. She tended the field for four months. And when the time came to harvest wheat field, a confrontation, on the reclaimed city land, which was then valued at $4.5 billion. She had a farm worker driving a big red combine to harvest the grain. 
She gave the resulting thousand pounds of wheat away to 28 cities around the world and spoke of, quote, misplaced priorities and deteriorating human values. This was long before most of us had any notion of what the misplaced priorities and deteriorating human values were. The hay was given to New York City's mounted police for their horses, wrote Jeffrey Weiss in the September 2008 Art Forum. Quote, perpetually astonishing, Wheatfield is one of land art's great transgressive masterpieces. As she investigates the nature of perception and the parameters of human values, she attempts to communicate with the immediate past and a distant future. Her magnificent 1996 Tree Mountain, a living time capsule, 11,000 trees, 11,000 people, 400 years in Finland was built on a gravel dump. This human made virgin forest in Anthropocene enterprise was planted by 11,000 people, each of whom was given title to their own tree. While Tree Mountain functions as its own time capsule, her other major works are each accompanied by a buried time capsule containing the artist's questionnaires and viewer responses. These include instructions for a hypothetical future, such as to be opened a thousand years hence. They question the viewers of each project. What is the future of humanity? As question 17 of the time capsule for her retrospective at the shed. Her final question for that time capsule expands the question beyond the human predicament. What may ultimate reality be? Dennis announced her commitment to ecological art in her earliest project, along with the first of her time capsules. Her 1968 rice tree burial included planted rice, chained trees, and her own haiku poetry. It was a private site-specific performative ritual of regeneration. Dennis reenacted it at Art Park and a ledge overlooking Niagara Falls in 1979. That first time capsule also began with an existential question. Do you believe humanity will become extinct someday? A plaque marks its site of burial to be opened in 2,979, a thousand years after the art park recreation. It was placed in a steel capsule inside a lead box within nine feet of concrete as if to protect it from nuclear disaster. Decades ago, Agnes Dennis envisioned drawings that visualized the earth as a restless pyramid, occupying the curved universe of theoretical physics. From 1973 to 1979, she worked on a series called Isometric Systems in Isotropic Space, Map Projections. In these exquisitely drawn works, the Earth is a pyramid, or it is twisted into a dodecahedron, a teardrop, or a snail shell. For her retrospective at the shed, she built a 17-foot high pyramidal maquette of hundreds of transparent bricks. Fifteen years earlier, she constructed four pyramids of conscious. conscience. One contains pure water, another crude oil, a third is filled with dirty water from the Rio Grande. The fourth is mirrored, casting its reflection 
back on whoever attempts to view it, for we have all participated in depleting our planet's resources. She envisioned her restless pyramid, pyramids as each containing habitats for 10,000 people, floating above a soon in uninhabitable earth, creating societal forms in celestial space in ways I don't entirely understand. In her writings on these pyramids for the future, she notes that they are created for a different world in which the inhabitants will live in space, hovering above earth or in self-contained, self-supporting environments. Flying pyramid for the 22nd century is to be made of silk. Another is called Probability pyramid is seen, seen through the eyes of a scallop. The artist comments, it is a tantalizing game if one learns to read between coordinates and doesn't mind making sport of the human predicament. Agnes Dennis was not only the first echo conceptualist, but is also arguably the best. She offered brilliant solutions to questions that other conceptualists left unanswered. One of her drawings takes up where Saul Lewitt left off in his wall drawings. In her drawing from 1973, she surpasses his intent by following through with a visualization of what might logically have been the next step, expanding into the actual dimensional world. I quote, straight lines are drawn in random places and directions on a sheet of paper. Assuming that these lines continue off the page, they encompass the universe, forming hidden triangles and intersections in space and returning to the opposite side of the same sheet of paper. Each intersection marks a moment in which something important occurs called the event. This could have been a parody if it weren't so profound. My work is a layering, evolving process, and the projects take years to complete, Dennis once explained to Lucy Lepard. In 1970, she anticipated a future in which evolution, I quote, evolution will be speeded up or slowed down at will and information will be dehydrated and coded for storage, to be hydrated for consumption at chosen intervals. A fine description of our present state of digital and algorithmic knowledge. Who else would have realized this or known that it would happen within our lifetime? By the middle of March, 2020, the corona pandemic had rapidly spread across the world. People all over our planet retreated to shelter in place. Skies that were once filled with smog reverted to blue. Waters became cleaner, air fresher, and wild animals were seen sauntering down empty streets in the centers of cities. Dolphins were spotted in the canals of Venice. Explaining the Anthropocene in the New York Times in April 2020, Michael Novacek, provost of the American Museum of Natural History, stated, about six million years ago, a giant asteroid hit the Earth, transforming climate so severely that approximately three quarters of all species went extinct. Now, we're kind of to that asteroid, unquote. That same month, Dr. Peter Domenical, director of the Center for Climate and Life at Columbia University's Earth Observatory, which coined the phrase global warming, said, quote, the laws of nature don't care whether we believe in them or not. We've watched the COVID situation unfold 
at incredible speed. The climate change is playing out on a much slower time frame. The tragedy and inconvenience we've seen from this pandemic pale in comparison to what's in store from climate change. There is a much bigger crisis knocking at our door. Agnes Dennis warned more than two decades ago that the turn of the century and the next millennium will usher in a troubled environment and a troubled psyche. She had planned to plant a time capsule at the Serpentine Gallery in London in the summer of 2020, but along with many other art events, that was postponed indefinitely. But in the spring of 2021, the 90-year-old artist instead raised a flag atop Tate Britain. On that flag, along with an image of a pyramid and a map of the continents, were these words. The future is vulnerable, handle with care. This flag carries a warning to us all, ignore your peril. At the beginning of this month, I emailed Agnes to inform her of this presentation. She emailed back, quote, RE the Anthropocene, it is an unsure, confused scene that will be understood only after it has been lived. Living forward, understood backwards. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. She had discussed the works of Agnes Dennis, as well as her pioneering philosophy of art and human society. She was really and has been really ahead of her time and made us think that she is such a great artist who fiercely thought about and practiced the environmental and human life as well as the art related issues. And I think um, what she said, the message on the roof of the Tate Modern conveys an important message to the society in the Anthropocene era. Uh, now, I'd like to invite Ms. Hyun Shim to fill her discussion and questions with regard to Kim Lavin's presentation. She received her PhD from Yonsei University's Comparative Literature Collaborative Program, and she is currently an academic research professor at the Institute of Media and Art of Yonsei University, and she is currently teaching media and culture theory at Tokyo National University of Arts and Kumin University. Distinguished guest, I would like to pose some questions regarding Kim Levin's presentation. As the coronavirus pandemic has reduced human activity since mid-March 2020, Instances of changes have been witnessed in various parts of the world, including the blue sky, clean water, and the wider field of animal activity. The fact that this presentation on the subject of the Anthropocene and the scope of Agnes Dennis' art refers to her is quite significant. Shall the current pandemic be put into the same category as global warming and the overflowing waste as something bad? This is rather a dichotomous question, but I believe we need to understand this question in the context of the relationship between humans and the environment, in the context of how the pandemic has changed our way of daily lives, in some sense making it more inconvenient, save the tragedies of losing loved ones, a family a neighbor or a friend to the pandemic. Can we take this as a kind of a rehearsal to become willing to bear the immediate inconveniences in order to address and respond to the environmental disasters? The safety-oriented measures we have faithfully followed, despite all the inconveniences, were introduced all of a sudden, but were not impossible, as they were premised on the shared belief and the massive sense of urgency that it should be done. How much more? More so if the safety here is not just for humanity, but also for the entire globe. When Dennis said misplaced priorities and deteriorating human values means that 
We have run the world on the foundation of misplaced priorities, pursuing human convenience, and have undermined human values in the area of humanity. We all know that we need to adopt a different way of life in a massive scale in order for the restoration of this planet and human nature, even if that means inconvenience for a while. Yet, not many of us dare to do so. We believe that the capitalist pace and efficiency brings convenience. If we break from such a pattern of living and embark on the pursuit of harmonious ecological value, we may experience some inconvenience for some time, but not for long. As we can see in the wheat field project by Denise, we're planting a wheat field in the crowded and expensive downtown property didn't make sense, but the harvest was distributed and practically feeding and growing people throughout the world. In her works, the environment is not separated from human society but interwoven with each other in a fundamental relationship. As the presenter pointed out, her famous land art projects have taken place not in the desert or volcanoes but in the field of the daily life of humans. This seems to be very important in her works. It looks more so in this time where the natural ecological environment and the social cultural environment of humans have become inseparable both conceptually and practically from the visual philosophy projects encompassing science, technology, philosophy, language, and putting them into sophisticated concepts and diagrams to the installations at museums and to site specific ecological projects that created shapes and buried messages in land, her works consistently express her interest in the humanity and the future of mankind. Yet, as she went regarding the 21st century more than two decades ago, quote, the turn of the century and the next millennium will usher in a troubled environment and a troubled psyche, unquote, and issued a warning earlier this year, the future is vulnerable, handled with care, she has been neither naive nor blindly optimistic. The warning contains concerns and criticism as in the case of her pyramids of conscience, where she put dirty water for a river from a river in one of the four pyramids and thereby forced us to realize that we are responsible for the environmental degradation. The time capsule that Denise buried in a forest in Finland in 1996 will be opened a thousand years later. This is profoundly meaningful to who will open the capsule, the human in the future, or an extraterrestrial life from the other side of the universe, or will this time capsule be left buried in the ground after humans migrated to another planet? In her Earth project, grains are planted, grow, and become ripe, and get harvested. Visited. Trees and plants grow to create a dense forest, suggesting the beautiful and sound utopia of the future. At the same time, she thus resolutely calls on us who live today, which is the future of yesterday, to live differently. I would like to hear more from the presenter about the relationship between nature and humanity of humans in the works of Agnes Dennis and uh, what her views were on the humanity. I would like to thank Kim Lavin for providing an opportunity to share Agnes Denny's perspective with domestic audiences across vast time and space, and also to Kangwon International Triennale 2021. This is the end of my question. Thank you. I thank Professor Shim for her thoughtful discussion of the work of Agnes Dennis, which sums up my contribution to this virtual symposium. At present, there is no answer possible. Humanity must act immediately or we will be among the creatures who will go extinct during this sixth extinction, which has been caused by our species. 
This is, of course, what has come to be known as the Anthropocene. I'd like to refer you to Teardrop, Monument to Being Earthbound, a crucial work at the center of Agnes Dennis's 2019-2020 exhibition at the Shed. This giant floating and illuminated teardrop, a sculpture held in place by magnets, seems to me to be an apt metaphor for our current predicament. I sent your discussion and my reply to the artist herself, who kindly answered with the following words. Quote, it's okay to teach our egos a few tricks. Regarding teardrop, remember it also floats. I have hope for humanity because of precedence, but recognize our failure. We, borrow, we bury importance in too much talk. From my viewpoint, as an art critic, oops, with a degree in Egyptian archeology, span as well as art history, we, we seem to be descending into a new digital dark age of ignorance and superstition. At the same time, amazing new technological discoveries and innovations could possibly counter this decline. Only the future, if there is a future for humanity or for some super intelligent species that manages to repopulate our planet, will be able to give an answer. Regarding the future, I would like to add a cautionary footnote. It seems insanity to plan to populate Mars as Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and other billionaires are attempting to do at great expense. Mars, a dead planet, once had oceans, and most likely it will be discovered that there was once life. Would it not make more sense to rescue our own dying planet, which is still habitable and more easily salvageable? I think we should all, in this time of, to quote Agnes Dennis, a troubled environment and a troubled psyche, remember her warning. Quote, the future is vulnerable, handle with care. Thank you. Then let us move on to the fifth session. I would like to take a look at the digital network and art scene in the contactless era from the art critic point of view. The presentation will be delivered by art critic Jinguk On. Jinguk On majored in printmaking and Korean literature at Hongyang University. He has served as a member of the editorial board of a comprehensive a human, humanistic political criticism journal, and his books include a Burning Utopia, Korean Contemporary Printmaking, Conditions of Criticism, Age of Declining Expectations, and Myopic Art. He will give his presentation titled Art in the Age of Mobility and Non-Face-to-Face. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you are. I'm Jinguk An, art critic. I'm very honored and privileged to be part of this international symposium hosted by Kawan Triennale 2021. Today, I'd like to talk about mobility and online art in the age without face-to-face -face contact. Let me start. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Many things are changing. Spaces where a lot of people used to be gathered are empty now. Movie theaters and concert halls where a lot of people gathered are vacated. And many families are not able to meet with each other anymore. Overseas travel is extremely limited. 
and people's mobility is very much limited as well and shrinking. It's the same in the art scene. Opening to celebrate art exhibitions are now seen as something to avoid. There is a fear that if you do that, you will generate harm to a lot of people. As a result, the movement of people has been greatly reduced. So has mobility really decreased? At the surface level, this seems very much so, but if you look a little more closely, it's not the case because OTT like Netflix has developed dramatically. So rather than people going to art galleries and movie theaters, people watch a movie through the system at home, like OTT system, and while people are not moving, big data at an increasing pace is moving. In addition, video conferencing platforms and apps like Zoom have the advantage of bringing people from all around the world together virtually. Each participant's data is constantly moving online. Real-time online classes are not that different. Instead of teaching at school in person, we teach and learn at home as if we were at school. Human mobility has decreased, but data mobility has increased significantly. The same is true for QR codes. We are taking QR codes to prove that wherever we go, we are the same. And there are such a great massive data and information which have gone mobile. The disaster notification text message also shows that data has moved a lot in our daily life, but we can see that although physical movement has decreased, information and communication are moving even more actively. Art is no exception, as the physical art exhibition space has moved to a non-material virtual space and online space. The way viewers approach works has changed, and the experience experience of appreciation is also changing gradually, then what form is online art that is taken in this time of virtuality and how is it changing? At the core of this question is, in fact, the way in which online so-called movement without physical movement, the absence of presence and the space of absent presence is created and sensed. To answer this question, we need to explore mobility, the interdisciplinary subject to understand changes in mobility. So I'd like to talk about mobility and online art. As for mobility, there are terms such as smart mobility, mobility service, personal mobility, mobility platform, and cocktail mobility. Some say that it is a story about a new way of mobility by combining traditional transportation and technologies such as IT. That's what mobility is all about. We often talk about it in connection with the discussion of network connection, autonomous driving, vehicle sharing, and electrification. However, this is really just an ideology led by the people who have invested in it. Practically speaking, such a definition is too narrow. From a broader perspective in a social science and humanities, mobility is viewed in a broader sense, implying various meanings such as mobility and fluidity. British sociologist John Urey was the first one who, to explore the meaning of mobility. He began to explore movement sociologically. When we talk about mobility, we can say mobility in Korean, but in reality, mobility in Korean has various meanings that are difficult to contain. So we think it is appropriate to use the original word mobility rather than simply translating it into the Korean word. It includes not only the movement of people objects and information, but also technologies such as trains, automobiles, airplanes, mobile devices, and internet systems that make this possible. Mobility is an extended concept encompassing any movement that includes the transformation of capital and even liquidity of state power and governance that is various types and speeds of movement in the world. As a result, some say it is a mobility paradigm. Some say it is a new mobility paradigm. Some say it's a mobility turn. 
And some even says it's mobilities, a plural. Anyway, it means different from before. All this is commonly referred to as mobility. Historically, there was also been relative art, moving paintings to the world from fresco paintings. It was when tempera appeared, and then the painting on the wall was moved to a panel. Then using canvases, you can roll up the canvas like paper and have the mobility to carry it around. Also, with the advent of tube-type pigment, now artists can work outdoors, not just in their studio. From the invention of commercial photography beyond the exhibition space, other spaces such as the imaginary museum of Andre Malo, or art museums without walls were created. In this way, a collection of works or photographs of exhibited works can be exhibited as well, or even collected. Besides that, there are many more stories about mobility, but recently, Hitush Nail talked about duty-free art. He talked about the art that existed in the international duty-free space in the airport that appeared as the mobility of international logistics and the commercial value of art were combined with the tax policy. All of this can be seen as a story about the mobility of art in physical form. On the other hand, online mobility art has emerged. Internet art has already started in the dot-com era in the 1990s, so has web art. In 2011, Google started a program called Google Arts. An art museum was created online. Then, from the 2010s, a certain virtual reality, a VR, AR, artificial intelligence, uh, reality or augmented reality, as well as mixed reality, MR and XR, extended reality, were applied to art. Then, from the late 2010s, we started to see a system for viewing works online in the form of an online viewing room. Also, before the pandemic, public art institutions made content and uploaded it to YouTube. Art was moving online a lot as the art continued to change little by little. Until then, however, in some way, art existed only as incidental to physical exhibitions. In a word, the physical art was central and the online platform was used as an auxiliary means. But there are many changes since the outbreak of COVID-19. It led to a situation where digital art can be sold in the form of non-fungible. Most known one is NFT, turning to metaverse. Geppetto is popular in Korea. Roblox is quite well known all over the world. And such a metaverse is created and various commercial transactions are taking place within the metaverse as well as exhibitions. Virtual exhibitions are taking place in virtual space and then the presented works are even sold. This is also um, combined with a system called NFT. So now in terms of quality, forms of art are changing. It is also expanding a lot in quantity. This reminds me of the structure of feelings mentioned by Raymond Williams. Williams said that uh, there is a structure of feeling, and uh, you can see that the structure of this feeling is being newly transformed. It is probably because of the digital, the internet. When it comes to what kind of space the digital, the internet space is, it seems to be similar to cyberspace, as John Ur mentioned. And because of that, now you can see the feeling uh, or the structure of feeling is changing. We look at the space in two different ways. In the past, it was very important the settlement place and us remaining and the source of our being. 
and it was perceived moral and moving things were subject to suspicion. However, in recent years, as seen in the Luaz and others, there has been a great emergence of nomadism. He talks a lot about nomadic flow, fluidity, and things like that. Rather than being confined to a place, they are now moving, talking about moving, interpretation of the space is rather dichotomous. However, with the advent of mobility, John Uri says that the space of a place merges into a space of flow, that is, separate places and spaces become a space of flow or a flowing space. We think that mobility is related to some kind of nomadism, but in reality, the mobility John Uri mentioned does not reject settlement, but water has the characteristics of settlement in that space. There is a space where immobility and mobility are combined and put together dialectically woven, that is, interspace, because the distance and time to move for work or travel has increased. Accordingly, the interspace between them has become a space where multiple nomadic communities overlapping in higher levels or areas are in harmony. In a nutshell, it has become a place where people in motion are attached and settled. So, what can be described as mobility structures of feeling is emerging, says John Uri. However, the existence and absence of such spaces are disturbing the space, and the fact that social networks can be formed and maintained while on the move is also expanding social space. This can be seen in some ways as being related to the spread of digital and internet technology. With the spread of digital technology, we are experiencing the expansion of these social spaces. It would be fair to say that our senses and emotions are being reconstructed into what we might call structures of feeling. Time and space are changing and being transformed as such. But will art remain the same? I think that a different grammar is being applied to art as well. You can see this as a grammar of online mobility art. What kind of grammar will art moving online have? What is important in the online space? Mobility. Moving quickly, high speed internet speed does not. Well, high speed internet. But speed does not does matter when moving, does it? I think that is the case, so mobility is important, and online art can be seen to be related to mobility in a way. Therefore, it is highly likely that it is necessary to take a lightweight and optimized data format. Rather than exploring one zone of online art, I'd like to point out that this form is emerging. I think this will change into a form of art that is completely different from the current physical art form. Because in the past, when photography first came out, well, it tried to resemble a painting in the form of a salon picture. In short, it tried to create a picture with a painterly feel. However, with the passage of time, photography changed to reveal its unique characteristics, so a street photography appeared, as seen in press photography or documentary photos. In this way, straight photos appeared against the background of its characteristics and technology of the photos. Therefore, mobility art can be seen qualitatively different from the traditional art museum we, see, we are thinking of. To name a a few of these other places. I think of the artwork as low resolution and simplification, fluidity in size, color mismatch, and bright colors. This work was traded at a high price through NFT. If you look at it, it's fairly rough and crude, so it's low quality and very simple. You can see the size of the pixel. These works can be seen as one of the characteristics of mobile art. It can be said that it is because it is optimized for transmission, because it can transmit, it can be transmitted very quickly, and because it is very simple form. Also, this kind of online mobility art can have flexible and 
different sizes. In physical word size, it's very important, and the feel of the word can vary depending on the size. But in the case of online mobility art, the size is not important, and the size can be changed flexibly because the size changes and the size varies depending on each device. Third, the colors may not all be the same. There will be multiple versions, even for one piece of artwork, and each version might have a different color because we are going to see the work through the panel of a digital device, and the color temperature will change depending on the panel. Depending on the manufacturer of the panel, the color changes slightly when the color temperature changes. It may be a very subtle difference, but it can change the overall mood. Therefore, even one work can have very different versions of colors. In addition, we will see works of very bright colors with such a vivid feeling, it can be seen as a work. In the case of a digital device, it can appear as a work with a splendid glowing color thanks to the backlight feature. There would be a number of features of online mobility art and can serve as some new grammar. In addition to this, the smartphone can be shifted horizontally and vertically because it is viewed a lot on the smartphone, so it can be changed into a slightly square-shaped image. Well, this is what you can see quite frequently these days on social networking platform. The images we see a lot online and on social media are all changing to a square image. But online mobility art is also changing to a square image because the work you see on your smartphone is also in a way online mobility art. But there are some problems because the social space and online space, a coded space, can create technological inequality. We have to pay more to get faster. You can get a clearer image with a better device. You will get faster, sharper, and better quality images, all depending on whether you can afford it or not. So, it can be very polarized in terms of cost for these technologies. If you can't pay for it, you have no other choice but to use a very low-speed, low-quality device such as a folder phone or even 2G phone. You can't see the work in good quality. Inequality can be increased like this, and you can see a lot of kiosks these days, depending on whether you can use kiosks or not. Technical inequalities can emerge and expand further. This is a slightly different example, but in the online space where everything is coded and the in the online inner space, we can interpret the code, click the menus on the menu bar and enter. Here again, depending on whether you can do it or not, inequality can arise. I and many of the people who are listening to this talk right now can use these devices, but devices and codes are constantly evolving, and will we ever be able to use them as they emerge? Those who can do it will not experience inequity, but uh, if we can, we will experience inequality right away. Even if we use it today, we belong to a class that can potentially experience inequality anytime. Paragraph 29 of the notice on diversity and social role in promotion of the protection of museums and collections adopted by UNESCO in 2015 says, new technologies are rather potential barriers for those who do not have access to new technologies or the knowledge and skills that enable them to effectively use them as well as for museums and art galleries. So from the perspective of people and museums, it can be said that a new technology can be a potential barrier in some way. The expansion of online art in the context of the pandemic is indeed an inevitable wave. 
Then, are we just looking at this expansion? In the midst of this expansion, we should explore the characteristics of this online mobility art and the newly changing grammar, and also explore the social inequality it creates without technological inequality. Furthermore, think about the technology of online art that everyone can enjoy. This is where we should go. With this, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. An. When we think about mobility, we usually think of automobiles and transportation devices. But the concept of movement and mobility in modern society is actually quite interesting in today's era of uh, moving toward a nomadic time and from a physical space to a virtual, non-physical space, it seems really necessary to explore new artistic experiences. And it seems that we need to think about the expansion of online mobility art and grammar with regard to that and technology inequality. Then the question will be posed by art critic Unok Shim. She is a creator and she has organized various exhibitions and events such as Pyeongchang Paralympic Games Games, Gwangju Biennial and the Gwangju Design Biennial, as well as various international exhibitions in Paris, UNESCO, and Switzerland. She worked as a postdoc researcher at the Paris Institute for Social Sciences and the French National Center for Science Research, and she is currently an adjunct professor at Tongkong University. Distinguished guest, I'm Inno Shim. Today, I'd like to ask two fundamental questions on Jin Guk An's mobility and online art in the age with a face to face contact. Here is my first question. Mobility, which is arguably the oldest and most important topic in history, may be further developed in the East in the interesting direction rather than in the West. In the West, the debate on mobility traces back to Parmenides and Plato, who focused on immobility, and Heraclitus and Aristotle, who complemented the concept of immobility, highlighting movement, the debate has continued even to date. Across time and space, in the East, mobility in its broad sense has been treated in depth as seen in Hai Ching, Hai Ching and the 500 years of debate in the Joseon dynasty on the principle of material force. As Ching Guk An's paper is set against the West, I will set aside the discussion on the East for another opportunity. The Western history in discussing mobility, where, whether in a narrow sense or broad sense, or in humanities and social sciences or natural sciences, clearly the finds the time and space and identifies the perspective of the discussion. In particular, for the Generation C, the distinction between the digital world and the physical world is ever more clear to view them as black and white. Part of such a perception is attributable to the fact that the digital world made of computer language is logical as aspired in modern times, and the time and space are also more subdivided, so unlike the contingent, not necessarily random, and unrecognizable the physical world. World. As long as something does not conform to this computer language, it is not executed or excluded, and users immediately accept such a decision without any protest and obey the logic. In Jingu Gan's paper, various expressions such as the disappearance of the existence, the, the appearance of the absent, and interspace blur the boundaries between the digital world and the physical world, would it be necessary to draw a clear line between the two worlds? Furthermore, since many world renowned scholars have already elaborated on the physical world, would it be necessary to study the conditions for the generation of the subject, object, and truth? According to the definition of Nietzsche in the digital world more extensively, and also argue based on Paul Verolio that the digital world is a spaceless space, a timeless time where geographic space and historical time disappear, enabling the creation and appreciation beyond the confines of space-time. I want to ask if it is possible, as the digital world too has hardware and our minds have bodies. Einstein once said, when all matter is gone, then space and time disappear. That is, matter and space-time have substance. Although we might feel that cyberspace is almost limitless with the advances in hardware and digital communications, most metaverse and digital worlds deliberately limit space. Also, the world of XR and the metaverse in a broad sense is not timeless and spaceless. It just feels that way. If we look 
get the program to build such a world. The timeline and camera view are much more detailed and segmented than we think. They look time limitless in terms of time and space because they are set against a different time and space according to the goal of a programmer who builds it or a program. Just as Kant said that the limits of human knowledge cannot think of infinity and eternity, timelessness and spacelessness are also implausible according to human epistemology. Artificial intelligence too will inevitably have a limited perception of time and space for the time being, as it does big database deep learning instead of machine learning through supervised learning. As most people do not distinguish one world from the other, yet I believe it is advisable to clearly define the two worlds first, separate from each other, to compare them and then reproduce the interaction between the two worlds. Turning to my second question. Critic on the text deals with the absent presence and present absence mentioned by John Uri. Some scholars in addressing absent presence include absence of presence, but this article doesn't. Does it mean body is overlooked? If body is not mentioned, how can artists be ele elevated and visually reproduce the sublime communication in the digital world and take responsibility for the present? As an example of absence of existence, generations MZ and generation C pretend that they are not present at a bus stop or in the elevator. On the contrary, the elderly who are familiar with the use of their body and know its value easily start communication. However, as for generations MZ or generation C, it is not that their presence is absent. They just feel the discomfort of their bodies in such if such a comfort is visualized and the dignity of humans' coexistence with objects are reproduced through art in the digital world, wouldn't it be one of the ways where contemporary artists take responsibility for the present? We tend to be more polite, careful, and respect, respectful in the digital world, such as the metaverse, virtual office, and virtual class where real bodies and faces are exposed. In that sense, the reality and the real body need to be expanded into the digital world instead of the virtual or digital world expanding into the real world. Unlike in the past, the presence of the body, not rationality, elevates the relationship and extends the dignity to the digital world in the present age. The present time calls for liveness face of the other. Once again, isn't it the role to be played by artists today to separate the body from the mind and the physical world from the digital world and compare the two to have a better understanding and remind people of the day of the need for communication between the two sensuously? Thank you. Greetings, this is Jin Gu An, who presented mobility and online art in the age without face-to-face -face contact. This presentation is my first attempt to find the interface between mobility and art. Rather than developing research based on existing solid theories, I found a significance in raising the relationship between mobility and art and various aesthetic discussions that may arise between them. In addition, it was difficult to include the vast contents of the recent mobility research. This might be the reason why I failed to lead the audience to have an in-depth understanding of mobility as the discussion was focused on key words. I would like to express my deep gratitude to Ms. Unok Shim, who read my discussion far from perfection and pondered in it and asked in-depth questions about the areas I needed to delve into. I'm a fan of Professor Shim Unok, so I also have read the paper she has written and receiving a lot of help. In this presentation, Ms. Shim asked two really important and fundamental questions. In brief questions pointed out the need for a clearer distinction between the physical world and the world of digital online mobility and the issue of timelessness and spacelessness of the digital world. And secondly, she mentioned uh, the body might be neglected too much in the concrete existence or absence of existence that is developed based on the mobility theory. Let me address these two questions. As for the first question, Professor Shim spoke about the relationship between the oriental thought, such as the principle of materials in the context of mobility, and said that it is deplorable that mobility argument is based on the Western context. I want to say that the purpose of this presentation is not to study mobility as an oriental thought, but to illuminate the relationship between online art and mobility based on existing mobility research, which is in the Western context. I really would like to see researchers who study oriental ideology to produce a study results of the concept of mobility as part of an oriental history and ideological system. So far, I haven't found anything like that. 
In fact, Professor Shim's first question was more about the part of my presentation that did not differentiate between the physical world and the digital world. Of course, if this distinction is clear, I think it would be good too. However, looking at the online world, especially the metaverse, I wonder if this can only be discussed only as the digital world. I believe that the online world is a mirror image of the physical world. Basically, it is human beings who build the digital online world, and I believe that it is built on the human world. In other words, it makes it easy for humans to experience them because they build the digital world based on the way humans ask about relations and the physical actions of humans. Therefore, I think that so-called digital online drama is implemented so that humans can conveniently adapt and utilize it when looking at externally visible functions, even if the internal algorithm or operation method is a black box. I think well, this is possible because the digital online world mirrors the human physical world. Would it be impossible to distinguish the digital online world from the physical world in this situation? It might be possible to distinguish them in certain ways, but in this presentation, given the time limit, it was a bit difficult to expand the discussion to the point of distinction. I decided to focus more on the phenomenon. In addition, Professor Shim talked about the mind and matter and raised the issue of seeing digitally immaterial things. I do not believe you can reduce the mind to simply the activity of brain organs and neurons. Isn't it strange to say that the mind is also immaterial and brain organs are the body of the mind? Similarly, I think that reducing digital online to simply the operation of hardware and operation of software is similar to saying that the brain is a brain organ. Simply requiring the brain organs to operate for survival does not mean all mental activity. Similarly, I think it is unreasonable to talk about digital online activities by analyzing hardware or software parts. Therefore, I think that it is unreasonable to understand digital online activity only by hardware or software. Obviously, I think these are also human mirror images. Therefore, I think that the focus should be on the way it unfolds that is the phenomenon rather than the physical materiality of it. I was all more interested in the phenomenon than the object. The mobile perspective also focuses on the event of a mobility, not on the physical aspect of what is an object, what is located where, and what is moving. Let's move on to the second question. The second question seems to be a derivative question and an extension of the first question. Professor Shim asked this question, if the content of the body is overlooked, and if the body is overlooked and this reference to the body is excluded, then how can artists visually represent the uplifting and uh, sublime communication in the digital world, how can they be encouraged and take responsibility for the present? In digital world, you mentioned the corporeality of artists is a really important part, and I think there should be a further research and awareness regarding this. However, as I answered in the first question, what I highlighted in this presentation is the case of mobility in online art, the phenomenon of mobility. The focus was not on objects or locations, but rather on the phenomenon of the objects and the aesthetics that occurred at the level of those phenomena. Discussions about the physiological, mental, social, and physical conditions of artists who can be said to be objects can be seen online discussing the creative process of art. My discussion of ability can be said to be a sub-discussion on online art, but it can be seen as a slightly different texture from the discussion about the creative process. It is a discussion about the online mobility phenomenon. The focus was on the phenomenon of an object moving online and moving from one location to another location that is, on the interspace, the space in between, the implications of that space rather than the location with respect to the object or location. I believe that Professor Shim's question pointed out what had not been considered in the broad con discussion and gave an important focus I can uh, put my efforts on. So once again, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Professor Shim, who read my presentation carefully and raised issues in important areas. I'd like to thank everyone who has responded to my presentation as well as the questions so far. Thank you very much. 
a new dimension to the spatial experience brought about by the coupling of digital media with the pandemic and the issue of the body, which was also mentioned in the discussion, is a very important topic in our media experience and art experience. In the sixth session, we want to talk about fiction in media that is similar occur and the issue of reality. Australian curator Damien Smith will give a presentation. Mr. Damien Smith is an independent curator and critic based in Melbourne, Australia. He served as Australian curator for the 2019 Havana Biennial Cuba and has written extensively with interest in Australia and Chinese contemporary art. He was a secretary to ICA Australia and teaches critical and theoretical studies at the University of Melbourne. And the title of his presentation is On Isolation and Pretense. Thank you. Technology. On isolation and pretense, thank you, technology. On the 20th of March in the year 2020, in response to a mysterious new disease known as COVID-19, Australia closed its international borders and little over a week later, the southern state of Victoria entered stage three restrictions, entailing strict stay-at-home orders. Since that time, limits on daily life have been variously tightened and relaxed. But 17 months on, there is still no indication that the lockdown will end. Small pleasures like going to art galleries or even visiting artists' studios is clearly off the agenda. Such conditions present significant problems for those of us who ply a trade writing about art and curating. For the International Conference of the Gangwon Triennale 2021, I've been invited to speak to the topic of simulacra as fiction in media and reality, focusing on a case analysis. The Melbourne lockdown strongly influences my response. Simulacra was a pet project of French philosopher Jean Baudrillard. As a young art student in the 1980s, I was an admirer of Baudrillard's ideas until 1991, that is, when I found his provocative statement that the Gulf War did not take place to be especially offensive. Of course, this was an overreaction on my part, as indeed Baudrillard was really talking about the presentation of those atrocities as a kind of media spectacle that obscured the true nature of the violence inflicted on the people of Iraq by a coalition of 35 nations led by the United States of America. Regarding the occasion of Baudrillard's book release, I recall thinking that maybe he was not really a French philosopher in the typical postmodern sense, but rather a kind of perverse intellectual Buddhist who saw all as illusion, just minus the compassion. I mused that his assertion of meaninglessness in the face of samsaric proliferation was somewhat valid, but also entirely lacking in moral or, ethically or ethical ground. I was certainly not alone in my criticism. The British philosopher Christopher Norris, for instance, saw Baudrillard as belonging to a growing body of uncritical thinking, while literature professor Donald Wessling saw Baudrillard as a non-foundational writer, which is not quite the same as fiction. Back then, Baudrillard really copped a beating, and I have no doubt that he loved it. His was, after all, a skillful mode of fiction devised to bypass the simulacra and expose a tragedy concealed by media hypocrisy. All these years later, I have had some time to reconsider Baudrillard's assertion concerning what he described as 
the procession of simulacra. We can think of procession as describing something like the smooth, slow spinning of a child's top where centrifugal energies oscillate around a central axis. It is this analogy that Baudrillard draws on to suggest that simulacra, or rather the infinite field of representations and imitations that we inhabit, orbit our perceptual field with such speed and intensity that our sense of reality is preceded by these representations, so much so that our access to reality is impeded almost entirely. As a student of Buddhist philosophy, it appears to me that aspects of Baudrillard's assertions resonate with certain doctrines concerning the field of samsara as being not so much a noun attached to external phenomena per se, but rather as a verb that accounts for the ways in which we interpret these forms to be. Now, having been robbed of my usual access to art galleries and to museum visits and city excursions and seeing my friends, I really started to wean myself from the busy side of life, walking the dog, gathering wild plants to eat, and actually reading books and then conversing with my Instagram addicted students about how this ancient practice is actually done, have become major components of life. In the context of the allotted topic, a life in semi-retreat assumes a certain degree of significance. After all, if simulacra is to be examined critically, which is to say the phenomena of representations such as artworks and imitations such as reproduced artworks, then naturally one needs to take a step back. Think of this as a methodology inspired by the yogic teachings of Patanjali, notably Pratyahara being the fifth limb of yoga and described as the conscious withdrawal of energy from the senses. Persistent retreating from the senses is one way to recognize the extent to which inaccurate or fictional narratives, i.e. simulacra, are a perennial product of the mind. For instance, there is indeed a side of me that is attracted by the idea that my life is lived as some kind of primary encounter, like I am an authentic person who has real experiences and I live life in a way that does not imitate someone or something else, and so on. Of course, art, and life for that matter, is not now and has never been a matter of exclusive, unmediated, authentic experience. There is always a text, always a context, always a narrative that plays to the encounter between viewer and art object. And this applies pretty much universally, including all of those so-named dematerialized, distributed and post-human artworks that require a little extra thinking to get in the know, as it were. So if we are really to critically examine representations and imitations as an expression of fiction, whether in media or reality, then perhaps we are better off asking if fiction, i.e. a made-up truth, is an inherent aspect of art in all cases, or if the production of artistic truth is perhaps dependent on the ability of the artist to produce a skillful fiction. Whether one is talking about Lucy Lippard's dematerialization of the art object, which is technically incorrect as even our thoughts have material properties such as the firing of electrons, or alternatively the kinds of epic fictions produced by artists ranging from Yayoi Kusama to Matthew Barney, one can readily concede that fictions are intrinsic aspects of art making and of our encounters with art in all its forms. 
Notwithstanding my own pretensions to authenticity in this time of isolation, here in Melbourne, Australia at least, I recognise the importance of technology as a part of the augmented reality attached to my encounters with art. But simply saying that I like to research artworks on the internet is not the least bit interesting. It reveals little, if anything, about the unique qualities of the art object as a conduit to experience, insight and knowledge. That is because knowledge in this context is not simply a matter of externally available information as provided by the internet and other sources. Rather, it is a question of self-knowledge and the extent to which artworks enable the inquiring subject to enlarge their world and to become other than they are, if only for a brief moment in time. The artworks that I would like to use as case studies, works moreover that play upon crepuscular mergings of fictions and realities, were included by me in an exhibition in 2017 in one of the more remote art galleries on the planet at Martimilli, at, uh, Martimilli Artists and the East Pilbara Art Centre in the East Pilbara region of Western Australia. On the one hand, we have a collaborative painting by two women artists titled Minipuru at Pankal. The work is dated 2016 and was painted by Nancy Chapman and May Chapman, two outstanding artists who are members of the indigenous Madu people who have lived in this part of the world for tens of millennia. Alongside this work, we have a salt drawing and installation by the Canberra-based artist Hannah Quinn Liven, and the work is simply titled Salt. In each case, the artworks are responses to physical locations and geographies. Their orientations are topographical, and the representational elements are intertwined with subjectivities that include personal reflections and mythic narratives. The area inhabited by the Madu is indeed one of the more remote corners of planet Earth, and it is certainly inhospitable territory, unless you happen to have been born into the ancient knowledge systems of the Madu people who have navigated and thrived across desert and spinifex country for countless millennia. In fact, Madu country is so remote that the Madu only encountered Europeans as late as the 1950s and 1960s, in part due to the British military testing their medium-range Blue Streak rockets in Australia and detonating the faulty rockets over this region. According to the Madu organisation KJ, the Madu are the traditional owners of the Madu native title determination spanning 13.6 million hectares, an area twice the size of Tasmania, and South Korea is somewhat smaller at about 10 million hectares. The determination includes parts of the Great Sandy Desert, Little Desert and Gibson Deserts, so a vast territory indeed. The painting shown here is invested with nuances and subtleties that emerge from the changing light, seasons and topography of the Pilbara region. But it is also a statement relating to survival in those environs. Thirdly, this is a layered production that can only partially be comprehended through visual encounter. The rest is dependent on processes of induction into sacred stories and myths, some of which are available to all and some of which are contravened and held secret in keeping with tribal law. 
In this instance, the Minyapuru, or Seven Sisters, are both mythic beings and the Pleiades star constellation. Significant work has been done on the Seven Sisters song lines and sacred sites running across Australia. And there is a link to research undertaken by Indigenous curator Margot Neal on this topic to be found at the end of this presentation. Here in these works are fictions that reveal important truths, and especially to those individuals whose lives are dependent on knowledge of the land. This painting, along with others, was paired with Hannah Quinlivan's installation, largely because of a shared thematic of salt, which appears as dry salt lakes in many Madhu paintings and is here represented in the material basis of Quinlivan's work. Equally, the works were paired on account of their articulation of psychogeographical spaces, similar to the meandering and organic lines seen in the paintings, Quinlivan's work is suggestive of natural processes and pathways. And since we are riffing on French philosophy, these works display rhizome-like characteristics. In concluding this very short presentation, the thank you to technology that appears in the subtitle of this paper is by no means an exclusive nod to contemporary technologies, which have been so important in keeping all of us connected during the prolonged COVID-19 lockdown. Rather, it extends to the unparalleled artistic technologies that cognize complex geographies at times spanning vast physical distances and sometimes operating as navigational maps for internal journeys, which are especially helpful where our realities and fictions meet and sometimes indistinguishably merge. Lockdowns and restrictions now seem a fixture of modern life. We cannot go wandering where we please. So a little artistic guidance is something that we can all certainly use. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for your presentation. It was very impressive that the situation of isolation due to the pandemic has led to another discovery and contemplation. In addition, he critically reflected on Baudrillard's concept of simulacral procession and introduced it so that um, we can sincerely observe the changes in daily lives. Next, I would like to invite Hyunjin Shin for the discussion and questions. Hyunjin Shin is an independent researcher and received a PhD in art from Hong Kong University in the study of alternative spaces and socialization of art in the context of social systems theory. And she has written various articles and papers with regard to that. Let me ask some questions regarding on isolation and pretense. Thank you, technology. Thank you for your presentation on linking perception with the entanglement between reality and art. I'm very interested in the process of perceiving social reality and art, so I was completely immersed in your presentation. In particular, I started to pay attention to cybernetics recently and then the related theories as well, so I felt somewhat related to your presentation incorporating the Buddhist theories. I found the word play in your text quite interesting. Turning a noun procession into a verb, active procession, perturbation, or a fictional representation into a pretense. Such a way of writing was inspiring. Perhaps it may allude to the reality of the near future generation who will have to pretend to understand or to master Pratyahara enough to understand an artwork even when they come to encounter the work only via the internet. 
I also found it rather frustrating that only five pages are allocated to the author. If more pages were granted, the author may have developed the idea of pretends to the virtual by the Lodge or Masumi so much so that the author would have fully explained the time to. Become other than they are, as the author mentioned toward the end of the presentation. I also thought that the author's paper may be a simulacre using artistic representation technology. With that, I would like to ask the following questions. If the procession of simulacre can be interpreted as a mode in the dynamic field where perception operates, then it would be possible to take one step further to interpret procession as perturbation. Perturbation is also a term coined by Maturana, a cognitive biologist who equated the reality with perception as well as a mood found in the border, which allows the perception the distinction of a unity. Interpreting perception as a dynamic mode of perturbation opens up the possibility of analyzing the process of understanding a work into temporal stages. Furthermore, the author said that simulacre operates in the perception or per perceptual field. If so, does it mean that simulacre occurs before or precedes understanding a sophisticated cognitive activity and simulacre wills an influence during the time of perception? And if an artwork is similar, doesn't the time and space where we physically encounter the work and suggest an alternative worldview or religion per se to the audience? Some scholars view the effect in relation to that. Some scholars view the effect and perception as part of cognition. Furthermore, the social systems theory, which argues that art creates and communicates through perception, considers perception as a sufficient condition for art. If perception is not involved, then it would be science or liberal arts. If an artwork produced by an artist who is specialized in perception is imitated or reproduced and cannot be communicated, shall we consider that as the technical incompetence or failure of the art or the artist? If art, too, is representation and simulacre, how is the distortion of reality caused by fiction in artworks different from the distortion in mass media? It would be fair to say that mass media contains a little bit of illusion and distortion there, so the actual distortion takes place. And if there is a such distortion, how is it different from the distortion made by Simulacor? And can you really say that the art is always good? You pointed out the limitations of the internet in that all it provides is information and we would miss things that can be perceived only through a physical encounter. I agree. Yet, for the sake of the discussion, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts. Mm. 
communication is the very basic condition for society. The social systems theory, which is based on the belief that the communal life of humans in society was enabled by communication, foretells that the invention of computers by making us miss these aspects will limit communication and nullify the existing social structure. So, there would be a fundamental change in the social structure if that is to be the case. Do you believe that technological advances such as HD 3D scanning may overcome such limitations by promoting and facilitating communication? If Pratyahara is required, as the author mentioned, in order to overcome similar curve, does that mean sensory information or perception are bypassed in an aesthetic experience and it can only be half an experience? Or does Pratyahara imply that criticism is a practice that comes only after an aesthetic experience different from an aesthetic experience that includes senses and perception? Or is it something that comes only after an aesthetic experience? Then last but not least, Please elaborate on what we would miss when we view an artwork on the internet rather than having a physical encounter with the work as you took an example. I raised so many questions. The question might sound paradoxical, but I really want to thank you for your presentation as well as your response in advance. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge my interlocutor, Ms. Hyun Jin Shin, and to convey my thanks for her thoughtful and very engaging questions. In truth, I would require much more than five minutes to respond to these reflections. So. Returning to our discussion on simulacra as fiction in media and reality, we're really talking about something like appearances and realities, or rather artistic fictions providing glimpses into the world in special kinds of ways. Not wishing to complicate an already rhizomatic area of inquiry, I suggest considering simulacra along two parallel trajectories. On the one hand, the level of social engagement, what has been referred to by Ms. Shin and others as the social systems theory. And on the other, through my short talk, the idea of a, of a vibratory universe being the concept of a, a primal ground underpinning phenomena in all its diversity. Firstly, I am not a physicist, so I cannot lay claim to theories that I am ill-equipped to describe. Quantum physics is therefore off the list. That said, it is not difficult to understand that the world can operate on different yet simultaneous levels. The world of the social, for instance, while at the same time the spooky department of quantum entanglement, which we sometimes glimpse in uncanny moments. Translated into Buddhist terms, the well-known Heart Sutra drives the point home through enshrining the statement that form is emptiness, emptiness is form. In other words, the sutra is an exposition of the Mahayana to truth doctrine, positing on the one hand the provisional or mundane and on the other the ultimate as the constituent aspects of reality insofar as it is available to us. Let's now apply that principle to art. For instance, one might think of the artwork as a meeting point across time and space of complex social factors and as a conduit for entanglements that we cannot entirely grasp. 
coming back to our two reference of the social systems theory and the vibratory universe, let us consider the social systems theory suggests that living systems are cognitive systems and living as a process is a process of cognition. In terms of the aforementioned two truth doctrine, I would put this statement in the provisional or mundane camp. It pertains to the day-to-day -day realities that we all routinely inhabit, which might also be argued is an elaborate simulacra. In contrast, I recall the Australian theorist Elizabeth Gross saying that artists ride the waves of a vibratory universe without direction or purpose. In short, they are endowed with the capacity to enlarge the universe by enabling its potential to be otherwise. Riding the waves of a vibratory universe sounds rather like being in touch with something akin to ultimate reality. Sometimes this may be the case, maybe Yayoi Kusama, but maybe not Jeff Koons. Miss Shin also picks up on my comments about Pratyahara being the conscious withdrawal of energy from the senses. Shin has asked, does Pratyahara imply that criticism is a practice that comes only after an aesthetic experience? Well, I don't think one necessarily needs to have an, ex an aesthetic experience in order to embark on critical analysis. Just read a standard art history text to know how true that is. Even so, a little reflection, a little meditation does go a long way. One needs time to digest the contents of artworks. And in time, one comes to recognize that the conscious mind does not even do the heavy lifting. The real work is done at a level that is perceived only dimly. That's why we have to write it down to know what one is thinking. This leads to a further question provided by Miss Shin. What does it mean that simulacra occurs before understanding? This, I think, is the entirely weird thing about Baudrillard, which is the issue of when is something simulacra and when is it something else? Like, for instance, the things around me are simulacra, but my understanding is real. Baudrillard would probably argue that our understanding is itself a simulacra. In other words, there is no exit point from the illusory nature of things. In contrast, one might turn to the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who suggests the true work of art offers us the gift of poesis, the uncanny production of presence where the past and the future are both at stake and the act of being in the world retains its proper meaning. In effect, Agamben suggests that the artwork has the capacity to provide a grounding in the present through its unique presence, channeled, as it were, from the primal field of reality through the artist who is uniquely primed for this purpose. And that brings the conversation to Miss Shin's seventh question. Please elaborate on what we would miss when we view an artwork on the internet rather than having a physical encounter with the work. Firstly, context, setting, texture, incidental encounters with other viewers and so on would be missed. And secondly, my view on this is really the antithesis of Walter Benjamin's viewpoint that the aura of the work of art is diminished in the age of mechanical reproduction. Actually, all that reproduction, all that simulacra, just makes the original even more enticing to see. People make pilgrimages to see artworks that they have already seen in reproduction. Why? because we want to be in proximity. We want to rub shoulders with history. We have this sense that some kind of entanglement will take place and we will be connected to the unique qualities of the creative act. In conclusion, Baudrillard was responding to his own anxieties about the media-saturated conditions of the digital era. Miss Shin countered with a reference to the social systems theory wherein living social systems are cognitive systems. And for my part, I have contemplated whether art and other technologies might form a conduit to experiences that transcend mere representations. 
I hope this does justice to your questions. Thank you. Well, in the previous presentation, uh, regarding the previous presentation, the in-depth uh, theoretical discussion took place, but we got to the relationship between art and uh, technology as well as the role of technology in ecology and regeneration. In the next session, we'd like to take a look at more closely on specific works as well as the art production with the artist and expert. In the seventh session, we will look at the regeneration of the daily life related to design, focusing on the actual case studies. In this session, we'd like to invite Sang Guan Ku, who runs a design studio called FAP365. And he graduated from Seoul National University's College of Fine Arts with bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree in design. He is the CEO of the Greek graphic company. And he has been in this business for over the past 25 years. And since 2015, he has developed 3D printing design, design files, and he has operated uh, FAB365, uh, which has drawn a lot of attention from home and abroad. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you are. I'm Ku Chang Guan. I will deliver my presentation on design and the regeneration of digital everyday life. In daily life, people use many products and items. These products are mostly mass produced and the way they are made is based on cutting process. However, this cutting process which dominates the manufacturing process or a mass manufacturing process has resulted in the standardization of the daily life of people who use these products suitable for mass production of a small number of items. Of course, there are other products that are handmade in small quantity, but their share in our daily lives was very limited. Meanwhile, additive manufacturing was developed and began to occupy an area where cutting process cannot be applied. The additive manufacturing process, or 3D printing, has recently begun to gradually change our day-to-day -day lives. The pace of change is gradual, and it is not really visible, but as you can see, it is not an exaggeration to say that 3D printing is taking care of almost every field that is close to our daily life, such as jewelry design and artificial teeth, and its use is increasing in some medical fields. 3D printing is currently used in medical applications such as reconstructive surgery for the face of a person injured in a car accident or in an air permeable, permeable cast. In other fields, 3D printing is researched to solve problems that are impossible to be solved or too expensive with existing manufacturing processes. As 3D printing gradually changes the daily life, we are actively reviewing and considering the use of 3D printing in the field of design that creates many products in our daily lives. Although these cases are using industrial equipment, 3D printing can easily create objects with only three-dimensional digital data. So desktop type small 3D printers are widely available. Although it is impossible to create very complex shapes due to functional limitations, 3D modeling software that is very easy to handle has increased. And the design data that can be produced with a desktop 3D printer is easily available through sharing sites. In recent years, much more affordable Chinese DIY do-it-yourself 3D printers have made it possible to own 3D printers that can produce great manufacturing results with only $200 to $300. With such a conducive environment, 3D manufacturing can be easily performed by the general public, if not professionals, and this has democratized manufacturing, so to say. These 3D printers are widely used by people in their day-to-day -day lives, and they are mainly producing parts for maintenance, hobbies, and other items necessary for daily life. These are regenerated parts of broken products, Recently, 
As more products made with 3D printers are sold online, they are also used in economic activities. The site was originally for trading handmade craft products, but recently a lot of products made with 3D printers are traded. All of this is done entirely with digital technology. Despite the high expectations for daily re regeneration through this digital technology, the slow spread of 3D printing is attributable to overconfidence in and misunderstanding about 3D printing. Although 3D printing is the easiest manufacturing method ever in human history, it has also some drawbacks. A major reason for these shortcomings often comes from a lack of understanding and misunderstanding about additive manufacturing. The first disadvantage of 3D printing is ugly marks left after the printing. In order to make an output from a 3D printer smooth while ma maintaining its shape, it is necessary to print a structure called support together to print. After removing these ugly marks a lot, second traces of lamination are left through the printing process this horizontal lines, and people who have seen mass-produced products with smooth surfaces point this out as a problem. The third is the relatively long production time. Although these shortcomings are continuously pointed out, 3D printing also has many advantages that go beyond the limitations of conventional cutting process. First of all, it can produce very complex shapes that are impossible with the conventional cutting process. The conventional cutting process could not produce angles that the cutting tools could not approach or realize. However, 3D printing, which laminates the inside and the outside at the same time, can produce complex shapes relatively easily. Second, a moving structure can be manufactured without assembly. Existing cutting process cannot make the inside while making the outside, but 3D printing has the advantage of creating a joint structure or a hinge structure that can move immediately after printing is completed because 3D printing stacks the inside and the outside simultaneously. Third, the size can be freely changed as compared to cutting process of mass production. In the case of mass production by means of conventional cutting, it was difficult to adjust the size because the die or the mold had to be remade when the size changed. But 3D printing can freely change the size with a few clicks in the software. Because of these advantages, 3D printing continues to spread despite the disadvantages I mentioned previously. And how can we further facilitate 3D printing with so much potential? I did a lot of research on this matter, believing that the problem could be solved with a design that reduces the shortcomings and maximizes the strengths. For the problem related to support, which is the first its advantage, there, were, there are types of design that do not require support. It is solved by designing to satisfy the specific shape condition in which support is not generated. In this way, one can obtain a smooth shape without leaving um, ugly marks of the part where the support is removed. The second disadvantage, the problem of the traces of, laminated, um, of lamination, the horizontal stripes on the surface, the disadvantage can be addressed by adding a lot of detail and decoration to the surface. The problem of traces of stacking can be addressed by using the human optical illusion. And the third disadvantage, long production time or printing time, this can be reduced to some extent by applying modeling or structure that requires relatively little, shorter printing time. In particular, support takes a lot of time to print. 
And if we design so that the support is not really required or not generated, then we can find a short end production time. I have been interested in the design that reduces the disadvantages of 3D printing and maximizes the advantages and have produced many designs to which the design modeling is applied. Nevertheless, they have not generated that much of a response than the opportunity to participate in the 7th Hangzhou Design Biannual in 2017 was presented. Uh, as I participated in the 7th Gwangju Design Biannual in 2017, more specifically the exhibition lab to start up the future, in the third gallery related to 3D printing, I took charge of everything. I visited many research institutes working on 3D printing in order to feature many new technologies and enrich the exhibition. These labs thought it was a good opportunity to showcase their technology so that they showed material properties and mechanical excellence along with various supporting documents. The content was good, but it's hard to grasp how technology can change our daily lives. So even after the Gwangju design biennial was over, I continue to be concerned in the designs that can visualize the excellence of technology, especially 3D printing. Then I came across 4D printing technology. 4D printing is a technology that creates a three-dimensional shape originally intended by deforming a printed object with a specific condition or stimulus. Ordinary 4D printing flatly outputs deformable and undeformable materials in an appropriate position and applies a specific stimulus such as heat or electrical stimulation to complete a three-dimensional shape. I thought this technology has a huge potential. However, the researchers only studied simple forms. I thought that this was inevitable because researchers pursue stability and efficiency of the technology. So I decided I would give it a try. I started thinking about how to visualize for the printing technology. I thought it would be unreasonable to design a complex shape from the beginning, so I thought about making it fun based on a hexahedron and then came up with a tin robot toy. The body of the tin robot has the head, arms, and legs attached to it. Since the robot is a popular item, I thought it would get a lot of popularity and loved love if I made it in the form of a robot. First, the graphic drawn on the surface of the tin robot was three-dimensional to decorate the surface. This reduced the traces of lamination, which is a disadvantage of 3D printing. It is a method of 3D design that I tried before to reduce the shortcomings. Second, the shape of the head and limbs was slightly adjusted under the modeling condition in which no support is required. Thirdly, there was an opinion that the head, arms, and legs should move immediately when folded, so I decided to utilize the advantages of 3D printing that gives mobility without assembly, which we studied earlier. As a result, this came out. The response was really enthusiastic abroad than Korea. Many foreigners who saw this um, didn't see this as 4D printing. Instead, perceived this as a foldable design, so they thought it was similar to origami. Eventually, the name was changed to foldable design, and the foldable design continued to evolve, but a major problem was identified in the process. In the foldable design, depending on the material, in the case of a specific material, the folding part was broken or torn quite frequently. To address this, although it has a folding structure, I applied a mechanical structure rather than changing the material. In 4D printing, a material structure should be applied, but instead, 
A mechanical joint structure suitable for this design was found and applied. When you as you can see, well, when the surface is cut so that it can be folded, the hinge is easily torn because the contact area was so small. However, the new design was no longer called a foldable design by customers, but a print-in-place articulate design. Print-in-place is understood only by English-speaking users. It refers to a design that connects several parts and prints them all at once. The design was called print in place articulate by adding articulated, a feature that has articulation and can move after completion. I did not stop there but moved to more diverse genres. I also made cars and used it in a variety of genres, from the pumpkin lights, which are used on Halloween, military tanks, and more recently, airplanes. It can be said that the zones and fields to which new designs with 3D printing it's limitless. 3D printing still has its drawbacks and limitations we are trying to improve, but there are still many shortcomings. Improvements are being made, but there is still such a long way to go. Let me be honest with you. However, I do not think the disadvantages of 3D printing are really serious big problems. When the shortcomings of digital graphics were pointed out in the early days of computer graphics, there were many artists using low resolution, which were pointed out as the shortcomings of the early days of computer graphics. Artists like Nabil Brody and April Freeman overcame these disadvantages and showed how great digital graphics can be and how many things can change in our lives. I do not think the downside of 3D printing is that big. While overcoming the shortcomings, I continued my research, thinking that a design different from that for the existing cutting process for mass production would come out. Currently, well, Fab365 website selling these designs is the 8th largest, 18th largest 3D printing design sharing service worldwide and has 90,000 YouTube subscribers. Also, several YouTube creators are working hard to introduce and spread our website and this kind of services. We also have over 90,000 Instagram followers. A lot of 3D printing enthusiasts are showing how fun this world is on their Instagram channel, also on Twitter and Facebook, how fun our designs are. Although the design optimized for 3D printing has its drawbacks, we believe that by expanding small lot production of various types, we will change the digital daily life of people with strong personalities in the future, and we will continue to strive to create new designs in the future. That's the area I'm focusing on. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. You elaborated on technical aspects of 3D printing and difficulties in the production process. It was an interesting and informative presentation, which made me get a glimpse into the designer's constant concerns related to the reproduction and revitalization of everyday life. It was quite interesting to see the printed robot. It was really cute and adorable. 
Then let us turn to Polish artist Anka Lasniak for her questions. Anka Lasniak is an assistant professor in media studies. Hello, my name is Anka Lesniak and I am here to give some comments and also ask some questions to the presentation by Sang Won Gu. Since I am rather from the field of art and design, thank you for the detailed introduction to the process of pretty uh, to the process of 3D printing, its advantages and disadvantages. Some facts presented by you were not known to me before. However, I would like to refer to the main topic of your presentation concerning the impact of technology on human life. I mean the development of technology in general, not only 3D printing. I would like to reverse the questions of how technology influences our life, which may reveal a bit of a different approach or different perspective. I would like to ask how we as human beings are shaped or designed by technology. I would also ask if in your opinion the technology that become more popular and intended to use by people in their own everyday life supports people's creativity or rather standardizes our imagination and teaches us to follow certain patterns or suggests us some choices that only seem to be creative, but in fact they make of us just more fitted consumers. The next questions concern the ecological aspect of 3D printing. Since 3D printing does not need as many resources and production facilities, it's considered ecologically friendly and less exploitive for the environment than traditional production. It does not consume mineral resources and does not waste water. However, 3D printing technology is not completely neutral for the, uh, for the environment and the health of people who work with it. Could you say that 3D technology will soon replace the traditional production of goods? If yes, to which extent and which areas of production? I also wonder how uh, the 3D printers that can be uh, used at home may affect users' attitude to the used objects. In this case, uh, she, he, I mean the user not only uses the objects bought in the shop and designed by someone else, but also somehow creates them. Do you think that the possibility of printing, producing the objects by ourselves may cause us to take more care about these objects and be more emotionally bound to them and not throw them away as in the case of goods we only bought? Do you think that the Broad access to 3D printing technology may change the consumption habits and in consequence decrease consumption. Could we consider 3D printed objects as craft objects? I would, uh, I would like also uh, refer to the last part of your presentation and the 4D printing possibilities. Technology used by medicine has become a part of our bodies. We are already cyborgs, which is clearly shown in the works made by Stellar or, or Lang. 3D printing offers us a possibility to produce a solid object with, let's say, stable features, 
such as size hardness, when the objects are already printed. In the case of 4D technology, we receive flexible, movable objects that transform themselves into another structure over the influence of external stimuli such as temperature, light, etc. Through these abilities, uh, they perform as biological organisms and become a sort of simulacra. Such a technology may be also used for medical purposes and thanks to the abilities of the objects printed in 4D technology, they can be used by us, for instance, as uh, artificial vines, uh, artificial veins and perform as real ones in the human body. So they can function together with the human body or as a part of a biological body. And the possible applications of for d printing uh, to medical purposes led me to the last question about the possibility of printing a substitute for plants, animals, or human beings in this technology. Cloning of animals or parts of human bodies raises a lot of ethical questions and it's under certain restrictions. If we imagine that uh, we uh, can print a copy of ourselves or someone else that can perform as a living creature, would it be rather a problem of ethics or copyrights? Thank you very much for your attention. Let me answer the first question. I design products to be used in ways that creator of the technology, I, didn't see. People sometimes use tools and technologies against the intent of the creator of the technologies and tools for creative Creative people, tools and technologies support creativity. They use those tools and techniques for the purpose, or they may be inspired and used them for no purpose at all. In contrast, the compliant consumer is not really creative or uses the tool or technology only when necessary. That's why I think these technologies make creative people more creative but make non-creative people only fit for consumption. So it all boils down to people, how they use them. And to answer the second question, the mass production manufacturing was not suitable for making certain shapes or objects until now, so the price of the product unfit for mass production has been very high, or it has been not possible to produce such item. On the contrary, 3D printing solves these problems, so 3D printing is expected to be responsible for the production of these products down the road. 3D printing is already um, responsible for dental prosthesis and jewelry. 3D printing suitable for small volume production is also being applied to the production of expensive small volume parts such as engine for airplanes. However, Despite these predictions, a traditional manufacturing object still dominate. So, with regard to the 3D printing, I'm focusing on digitizing and transmitting products in relation to 3D printing. Going one step further, this can trigger and cause logistics and tax issues among and between countries. So far, we've focused on manufacturing, but we haven't talked much about what comes after that. Digitizing and transmitting products can cause tax-related and logistics-related issues because the intermediate process would be different. So, in addition to applicability from a manufacturing perspective, I think there are things to consider in relation to tax issues. So, I believe this is the area we would need to apply a new perspective. As for the third question, I 
personally view 3D character, 3D printers as players, like music players, rather than machines for manufacturing production. There are creative people who make and record music, but there are very few, and most of us would consume music only. I do not believe people would be really attached to the manufactured product. So, I do not believe it will be difficult for the products printed with the 3D printers to have the same value as handcrafts. To address the fourth question, artists or people's faces already have portrait rights and copyright as two-dimensional images. This is limited to the appearance, but in fact, even in the case of machines or objects, it is not an exception to perform a specific function. And the form itself is subject to a technical patent. So from a mechanical point of view, the shape or organ of a person can also be viewed as an object or a part with a specific shape that performs a specific function. There are many legal issues to be resolved in this area. So, there are many things to be considered, and uh, these issues will be tackled over time. I hope this answers your questions. And uh, once again, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. In the eighth session, we will look at mini artists and works with the theme of ecology. The presentation will be delivered by art critic Jean Bundy. Jean Bundy got her PhD from the Institute of Doctoral Studies in Visual Arts, and she studied at the Art Institute of Chicago, the University of Chicago, and the University of Alaska. Uh, she will focus on conceptualizing climate change and social dis disadvantages. And uh, she has authored and published more than 250 art critics for multiple publications internationally. She will present her um, idea with regard to the critics' interpretation of uh, climate change. Hello, I'm Jean Bundy, an art critic in Alaska. The title of my paper is Critics interpret climate change through art. Art critics are on the front lines of the aesthetic world, camera and iPhone in hand, making instantaneous observations to be pondered by art historians. Richard Howells and Robert Madsen relate. There seems to be a universal need to record human experience in visual form and this is true of the cave paintings of Lascaux as it is of the multimedia visual culture of today. Critics scrutinize exhibitions in evolving colonial S museums, stroll streets, sleuthing graffiti, maneuver around site specific works and converge at conferences with artists and historians, each desiring to spread the word that climate change visually expressed can result in change. As Julie Reese writes, these joint efforts are needed because the vast repercussions of global climate change are difficult to grasp for most people and individual artistic responses can effectively break it down to a more comprehensible scale. Art critics provide counterpoints too. Harking back to the 18th century Captain Cook era, when exploration and desired acquisition of the Pacific Northwest was mapped and illustrated, it became evident that these locations had abundant flora, fauna, and minerals for plundering. No one considered any environmental desecration. Today, eight Arctic countries, US, Alaska, Canada, Iceland, Greenland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia are instigated when sharing their global warming evidence with help from art, art critics. Carolyn Shields references the mid 19th century and says, steam power gave birth to the rapidly expanding railway system and to more efficient navigation of waterways by steamboat. Newly enlarged and mechanized factories produced goods that were shipped by rail and water. 
For vibrant artists, a landscape sliced by train tracks or a horizon dotted by smokestacks were potent symbols of the era markers of modernity and progress. Edward O. Wilson postulates that humans lack sensory capabilities. So early man gravitated to design a theory which explains why six artists presented here can best call attention to global warming either by direct observations or recycling of material goods into aesthetic metaphors. In UPI photographer Brian Adams, Kivalina Seawall, Kivalina, Alaska 2007, depicts realities of climate change as the northwest coast of Alaska is eroding. Kivalina is an island of 400 in Yupiak residents in the Northwest Arctic borough, which is slowly returning to the sea. Residents hunt the bowhead whale, which becomes difficult as ice packs grow thinner. Boxes and sandbags are a temporary fix to the actuality that endangered villages will eventually have to relocate at great expense. Clay sculptor Alana DeRoche's emaciated polar bear 2019 drags itself gasping for a final breath. This ceramic animal is hyper anatomically correct and thus haunts as an object and perplexes because it appears to exude pain while experiencing death and loss, not only as a genuine polar bear and its shrinking habitat, but subjectively for our loss as humans slipping away from that which is our place too. According to W.J.T. Mitchell, the true found object never quite forgets where it came from, never quite believes in its elevation to spectacle and display. Dorochi's object copy spars for attention with a genuine polar bear and thus heightens awareness of its role as poster child for climate change. African-American painter Cy Gavin, The Future of Tucker's Point, 2016, addresses overdevelopment on Bermuda's remaining vacant land. Gavin envisions the removal of condos and golf courses built over property once inhabited by enslaved African Caribbeans who appear as a ghostly apparition in his paint. Gavin alludes to the paradoxes in paradise, which include acknowledgement of past transgressions versus the need for local employment and the inevitability that prof profitable beach property development overuses water and pesticides. Sammy Norwegian multimedia artist Geertor Holmes Fugetta, 2014, repositions reindeer carcasses in a chandelier, thus morphing nature into an anesthetized commodity. Holm is questioning the Norwegian government, which culls Sami herds, their indigenous sustenance. So the grazing land, which hulls subsurface minerals can be repurposed. Mining, however, pays for Norwegian social welfare, which includes Sami healthcare. Fugetta is also reminiscent of musical fugues having interwoven voices and rhythms, it reinterpreted here as the incessant tug of war between aboriginals, environmental groups, governmental agencies, and mining companies while climate change escalates. Australian mixed media artist Sue Ryan's Ghost Dog 2012, wired from abandoned fishing nets and beach songs, calls attention to befriending neglected animals who play an important part in the Earth's ecosystems. Today's drifting fishnets pose greater health issues to sea creatures as they are not made of natural fibers and don't decompose. Nets and rope can be lost in a storm or deliberately discarded, continuing to entrap and strangle marine life. Cleanup foundations exist but don't make a dent in the floating death traps. Northern Cheyenne muralist, James Tempty's Think Next Over Now, 2019, employs the genre of graffiti for his Billboard S photograph of a teen standing in a field, clasping a handful of dirt vegetation. 
Some background tessellations are blank, suggesting what life might be like when global warming continues to alter the planet. Since this is a parking lot, handicap signs become part of the composition. One of the handicapped signs fetched up on the breast pocket of the youth jacket, looking like the garment was manufactured with that label. This photo montage becomes a narrative for climate change with this representative every youth cradling a piece of earth. Yes, we are handicapped because we can't balance needed productivity while cleansing the environment. This impacts the young who are rightfully wary and depressed. Art critic A.O. Scarts writes, we are far too inclined to regard art as an ornament and to perceive taste as a fixed narrow track along which each of us travels. We trivialize art, we venerate nonsense, we can't see past our own bullshit. It's the job of art to free our minds and the task of criticism to figure out what to do with that freedom. Art critics investigate the visible while contemplating the metaphorical unseen, propagating museum and community involvement plus self-awareness for protecting local and global place. A Time Magazine cover 2006 shouted, be worried, be very worried. Climate change isn't some vague future problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Well, thank you very much for taking a deep interest in the efforts of the artists observing the issues of climate change, warning and environmental pollution and degradation all over the world for introducing their works in detail. The climate change is not a big future, but it's something we have to seriously worry about. Now I'd like to turn to Professor Young Hwa Ryu for her question. And she is serving as a senior curator at the curation team at the Asian Culture Center. Located in Gwangju, in particular, uh, she has created Light and the Move and various other exhibitions, especially what well, this exhibition explores the coexistence and healing of humans and the environment by examining the political and historical environment of society, starting from unique memories related to the environment by Asian artists from a microscopic point of view. Distinguished guests, I'm Yong Ah Ryu, a senior curator of content development for the curatorial team of the Asia Culture Institute. First of all, I'd like to thank Common International Triennale and the Korean Society of Media and Art for allowing me to participate in this international academic conference held under the theme of revitalization of everyday life through technology and art in the Anthropocene Epoch. I also want to extend my gratitude to the presenter, Jean Bundy, who introduced significant works regarding ecology-themed media art, which is part of this conference through her presentation, Critiques Interpreted Climate Change Through Art. As the presenter mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I also believe that artists and curators are trying to help people experience the massive and enormous climate crisis by visually showing landscapes, situations, and memories related to each environment we can easily find to relate the issue of broken equilibrium of the ecosystem afflicted by the increasingly severe climate change. I believe that a micro approach rather than a grand discourse makes it easier for people to feel related to climate change issues. I also think that art historians and art critics interpret these artistic attempts, look into and consider which of them is more meaningful and valuable in order to suggest a new artistic direction. In this regard, I would like to ask the following questions. First, although they do not intend to, as artists and curators leave the time with a desire to live a meaningful life, their artistic activities related to environmental issues inevitably tend to be enlightening. In terms of expression, these works tend to use waste materials directly capture the images of animals suffering from plastic waste or include ecological elements similar to the works in the past. 
The problem is that these tendencies might be viewed as a cliché, as they have continued from the past. So, in order for the artistic practices by artists and curators as intellectuals not to be stale and at the same time fulfill the responsibility of making a better world, specific methods and strategies are needed while acknowledging the importance of the artistic capabilities of individual artists and creators. Artists and curators need to find concrete methods and strategies to set their practices apart from those of the past at a time when the general public carries out extensive enlightening practices such as zero waste. If so, I wonder what that could be. And in connection with the first question, I would like to ask for your take on how to make a proposal for the future from a post-human perspective. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jean Bundy, and I'm responding to questions about my paper, Critics Interpret Climate Change Through Art. The questions appear on the screen. Here are the answers. Answer to question one. Visually exposing the public to global warming on the community level gets the attention of larger government and philanthropic agencies. Just like the first man who took a stick and drew in the sand, it all begins in unsuspecting arenas. Since Black Lives Matter and the COVID pandemic, art venues have gotten away from exhibitions about the self and returned to shows about the other. Throwing laundry onto a museum floor, a metaphor for someone's psychological angst has been replaced by representational imagery of animals and humans in peril or natural disasters. Museums, large and small, are places to start understanding the world in distress, while outdoor wall spaces, graffiti, capture the passers-by. Most artists, unless they have acquired money to travel, interpret global warming in their neighborhoods, while some able to acquire attention nationally and internationally. Since COVID, the Zoom platform has allowed artists to engage with other climate change enthusiasts worldwide. True, there is a lot of rhetoric and rational solutions are few, with the bottom line being money allocated to reduce global warming while avoiding the intercession of greed. Dilemmas. You won't stop the production of oil and gas before an affordable substitute has been found to safely and effectively heat homes. Solar panels need a lot of water and water can be in short supply. Electronic devices need heavy metals unsafely mined by workers who receive little pay. However, the local level is the core with unsung artists visually alerting action groups who then coalesce with neighboring community groups banding together to force governments into action and philanthropic institutions to write checks. They are the only ones to fix the climate, but they need to be pushed by the people. Answer to question two. I cannot imagine myself as a post-human or some partially robotic creature unless forced by some professor in order to pass a class. While robots don't get cancer or industrial diseases, they do require precious metals and part replacements that ultimately pollute too. The human imagination propelled by authors like Jules Verne have inspired others to invent, but we can't pass the buck to computerize machines. People have to fix the earth and be alpha males to AIs who assist. Humans must move beyond nationalism and embrace the entire world as their responsibility with everyone working, surviving together. The entire art community, academics, artists, curators, and critics possess the best platform 
to visually argue for climate change on micro and macro levels. Thank you. This is the last session of the conference. I would like to invite artist Jung Hun Kang, who produces and exhibits media works using emerging technologies such as augmented reality. He is a media artist who studies and experiments in new directions of media through the combination of analog and digital, trying new combinations of art, design, and media. He obtained his degrees from Seoul National University, both undergraduate and graduate, and he studied media. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you are. I'm Kang jong Hun. It is not easy to figure out the direction and potential of art using media. New technologies are emerging almost every day, and the artworks using the technologies are constantly created. Looking back, whenever photography, TV, computer, and smartphone came into being, art constantly evolved for its own survival under the threat against its identity. For art, the emergence of new media has always been both a crisis and an opportunity, and art has long since overcome mannerism and encountered a moment of freedom through new media. In addition, through the combination of various genres, the five senses are stimulated and new senses are expanded, engaging the audience through various media such as photography and video. Therefore, it would be fair to say that how to stimulate and expand various senses has been attempted for a long time. Perfect representation using media generates a sense of presence that creates an illusion as if the individual in the picture is actually in front of our eyes. Such an illusion makes the person in front of the work pause for a moment. Also, we can see through many examples that the presence helps the viewer to be immersed in the artwork. Realistic media such as media facade, projection mapping for the cinema, augmented reality, and virtual reality also serve as tools that deliver platforms by realistically reproducing real objects or humans with digital media. So far, I have paid attention to the characteristics of indirectness, plurality, and materiality of print, photos, and videos. Printmaking and photography, which form the conceptual foundation for digital media, have been threatened and at the same time for their survival digital media. While a print is an image with the original version, digital media was a similar curve made of codes and concepts. These factors again threatened digital media. Media art without materiality exists only in the form of electron that cannot exist on its own for this very reason. Digital media has relied its identity on a form that contains images without originals. This holds true for video art, computer art, internet art, and multimedia art. The Therefore, one can infer that the combination of digital media, which has no materiality but temporality, and analog media, which does not have temporality but has materiality, is one of the major trends in the expansion of art using media in the 21st century. So I have attempted to overcome each media's shortcomings and create visual simulation by combining two types of works that give materiality to digital media and temporality to analog media, such as prints and drawings. In other words, a conceptual appropriation take place that makes it difficult to distinguish whether what I'm looking at is the original or a copy, or that the original itself becomes an artwork, and the artwork becomes the original again. The original exists, yet is not the original, and there is no original, yet there is the original. By combining analog and digital media, I believe that the virtual imitates the real, the copy turns back to the original, and the definitions of the original and the reproduction are mixed. The reappropriation phenomenon, where the distinction between them is meaningless, is revealed through works of art using digital media. This is my intent. I wanted to visually expand the situation where that what was thought of as blocks of a print become a work in itself, and a work that was thought to be a pencil drawing becomes a stage or platform of augmented reality. The first works that reproduce previously mentioned phenomenon are wood blocks, white goods, and time in TV becomes light without sound using production mapping technology. The wood blocks used for making prints were cut with a laser cutter 
order to give a the woodblock carving itself a plurality, and an image was projected on the woodblock carving using projection mapping technology. I wanted to talk about how the original blocks become artworks and the blocks themselves can become a unique work that meets the definition of engraving with plurality and indirectness. The second work is a drawing digital toys using augmented reality technology. The drawing work itself, drawn with a pencil, becomes a platform that is a marker of augmented reality technology and augments the digital image on the drawing, thus the work becomes the original again. In order to experience a new perceptual experience, projection mapping was used on woodblock pieces made with a traditional engraving technology or technique. Typically, flat works such as prints contain one still image on one screen without movement or sound. It was an attempt to bring life to such prints. A live action video is projected on a fixed object to bring the work to life, and motion graphic effects are are added. Smoke, dust, light, radio waves, sound, and line art were projected onto a piece of wood blocks. The theme of the works using projection mapping is twofold. First, TV in t time in TV becomes light without sound, puts together electronic items using sound and light. Starting with the Big Bang of the universe, seen through the gap in the door, rotating objects, light emitting objects, and sound emitting objects are connected all turning into dust, and the dust is visualized as an arrangement in which the dust is connected back to digital pixels. Second, in white goods, all white home appliances are gathered and placed. The home appliances we use are inventions that have improved the convenience and efficiency of human life, including washing machines, refrigerators, microwaves, electric pots, rice cookers. Home appliances such as air purifiers are products that require electricity for use, and some home appliances require electricity to be supplied 24-7. For clean clothes, delicious dishes, hot food, and tea, we are using a lot of resources and energy, which is accompanied by global issues such as severe environmental degradation and depletion of resources. The use of digital media also brings down the consumption of resources such as time and paper, and it seems to save storage space. But since digital cannot be used without electricity, it is ultimately just another destructive act, which paradoxically reflects the reality that digital media cannot benefit the planet. I wanted to visually illustrate the structure of the vicious circle using media. In order to capture this in the work, a paradoxical situation was reproduced by arranging a thermal power plant that emits soot from a chimney to produce electricity in the work and the air purifier that consumes the electricity to purify the air. I intentionally show the situation where the electricity is consumed to express this through the works. Through the reappropriation of the media, this was also linked to the immateri immateriality of digital media. Digital Toys features a 3D scanned toy object using augmented reality. Floated on a pencil drawing of a toy, total of 39 toys were 3D scanned and then processed into low polygon. An augmented reality toy was applied using Unity on a pencil drawing drawn with low polygons. When you run the app on your phone and project the drawing on the camera screen, a 3D object appears on top of it with the sound of a real toy. This work was inspired by videos of YouTubers playing with various toys instead of watching a YouTube video. This is a time when many children are already more interested in the toys on the screen rather than the actual toys. The drawing works are again used as markers in augmented reality to bring up virtual objects and the audience plays with the toys on the screen. 
We cannot say this is a phenomenon unique to children, and surrogate experience contents related to games, mukbang play, and travel are likely found in YouTube, a representative digital media. The transition from the real world to the virtual world has already begun. The situation appropriated by digital media was brought back to the museum, and it has been accepted as a new experience in connection with this special speciality. Attitudes such towards such experiences are also differed by generation. The child gets as close to the picture as possible, and adults look at the picture from as far away as possible. However, the gap is small compared to other works of art. According to past experiences, there are differences in the way people embrace contemporary art by generation, age, and gender. Responses are relative according to one's perceptions and experiences. However, crossover art is recognized to play a role in narrowing the gap to a certain extent. But works are produced by continuously going back and forth between digital and analog techniques, from the ideation until the audience experiences them. The combination of analog and digital is itself a cycle of original and a copy. Through this work, I try to visualize the phenomenon of the reappropriation of analog being the original. And then the digital becoming the original. Through my works that show the combination of digital temporal temporality and analog materiality, and the contemporary cyclical process, I try to present the possibility and the perspective to narrow the gap between art and technology. These attempts allowed me to try crossover art based on new expressions by reducing the strict dichotomy between analog and digital reality in virtual technology and art and old and new. In addition, I think that this experience will be a Able to present aesthetic challenges and suggest new perspectives on the combination of various genres in the future. Thank you for your time and attention. In the digital media technology environment, the artist contemplated a process to combine originality and the copy, the original and the copy, materiality and temporality in various technical and technological systems in traditional and newly emerging digital media. For the discussion, I'd like to invite Xia Yang Guo, an independent curator and founder of the Art Center, a nonprofit art organization in Beijing. Xia Yang Guo is a graduate of the Beijing Central Academy of Fine Arts, majoring in art history. Hello, everyone. This is Xia Yingguo. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Thanks for having me here. It's a good opportunity which made me to reflect the relationship between art and technology again. And I'm very glad to respond to Mr. Zhang Hun's paper and the speech. You know, we see that in art is the first work, white uh, goods. I think here the artist confused the relationship between art, be, between the original and the reproduction. Because when we see original reproduction, we are seeing that one object has a similar nature to another, or there's a similar form, a content, or similar in the major function. But if two different things put together, there's no distinction between original and the production, and such as a good print and the projected image, they, I think they are different. So there's no relationship between them as, a, as a, you know, original and the reproduction. Also in this work, and the, the concept of the original and the reproduction happened, uh, ha like it has not been weakened. We can see that the printmaking, printmaking here are original works. Digital images are original work too, and uh, also, Moving image and the print as a whole is also an original work. In this case, obviously, the, the, Im the moving image and the print are together uh, as a whole is a work in the exhibition space. If they are shown in a different way, of course, they could be displayed or sold separately. As two works, they, there, there would uh, still uh, no conflict. Into the art, into the art world, artists are, can change the content con context of the, their work in variety of way, of ways like Duchamp did. Let's go further. In this work, the artist through computer technology to, uh, the to to put this you know two ready-made uh, work combined perfectly, and in a sense, is the representative of the technology itself and. 
And the impl implementation of this technology itself in the sense of Deleuze, the French philosopher Deleuze, and the, yeah, we, we can call this the repetition. The question is, uh, where's the art part uh, of this artist's work? And uh, well, that's the key question I want to discuss. Move on to another work and uh, mentioned, by, mentioned by artist, the, the digital toys. In this work, we see the artist sketching first and then the audience can see a uh, AR digital image on their phone. Of course, we can still uh, divide this work into two parts to elaborate. One is on the wall, we can, we can call it A. Another one is on, the, on your phone, we can call B. One is uh, analog, another one digital, as the artist said. Same as the previous work, I also don't think there's a problem of uh, original and uh, reproduction conflict in A and B. We can still think about the A and the B uh, as a collage relationship. So even if B is a uh, uh, Augmented reality uh, reality version of A because uh, it's use AR and it's uh, augmented reality. So, uh, but in fact, they are just the two different scenes. They, they are interrelated. We say artists are using AR skills. The mean, that means he is using technology to collage two scenes in the same uh, junk position and then present the one whole work one work. If we only discuss the implementation of the collage of this work, that is the only technology in this. Here, art is the representative of technology. And the same question is, where is the art? And the one we say is the piece of art. What's the relationship between art and technology? Isn't the case of uh, implementation of uh, such technology? Art is uh, a representation, uh, uh, reproduction of technology, or technology enhance art? If art is enhanced by technology, where's the art part? As far as the artist's work we see, we can also divide it uh, into two, two parts to, to elaborate. One is the part that the artist created through his uh, own hands. The second is that the artist is through the computer technology. The computer produced the digital images and physical materials to connect, to be connected as the final work. When, when we discuss art, generally from these two levels of, of discussion, such as the quality of the artist, the painting is good or not, the computer image is good or not. Second is what's the content and the theme of this creation and why. We also discuss it uh, from uh, the perspective of this uh, form and the content because uh, in this, the technology is actually uh, a very in, in, independent thing. It's just like we use a pencil or ink, it's just a prop on this level. Essentially, it doesn't make our art looking you know, more different. So I think technology here doesn't enhance the art itself. In fact, this is a very important issue in today's art world. And because with the development of technology, more and more artists want to use the new technology to create a work. The problem is that technology doesn't always add energy to art or make it more valuable. Instead, we can see to some extent, artists are indulging in technology. So in many of today's exhibitions, art, uh, art is becoming more and more techn technology de in, uh, dependent as if the work has to be expensive. When we talk about the, uh, the word art, we can also argue on two aspects. The first is the art itself. The second is the relationship between art and the world, uh, their reality. And back to the two works mentioned by artists, the artists that discuss the art itself, such as the relationship between artistic uh, creation and the technology. Then the artist also mentioned his work and uh, today's uh, social problem. Uh, such as the environmental issues. So for me, this is the important part, which, uh, me, which, is, which is meaningful and valuable. I will give you another ex example like the team lab. And we, we all know, and a lot of audience like to participate uh, in this uh, immersive uh, uh, practice. But what does team lab give us? It's just the experience that treats uh, virtuality as real. Do they reinforce reality or do they respond to reality? Obviously not. Uh, reality is far more powerful than this uh, virtual scene. Of course, responding to reality is not their aim. So on the artistic uh, level, I 
uh, I think it has very little artistic value in the team lab work. So how do we define art, uh, art day? What's art? And what does art do today? If we do discuss today's social issues, if we don't discuss social issues, today's social issues or uh, and if we don't discuss what art is for, there's no way to talk about what art is. Maybe we can borrow from uh, Deleuze. He mentioned in his book, Different and Reputation, what thought is. And he says, thought is something in the world for us to think. This something is the object out, uh, not its object, not of recognition, but of a fundamental encounter. So I think art is the same as thought here. And if uh, art doesn't prop us to think, but merely uh, reproduce uh, one side uh, reality, all we can say that is really a simple reputation. Here, let me briefly talk about another experience. Recently, I went to the MMC Seoul to see exhibition. This exhibition, I would say technically, very good. And uh, in terms of looking, the condition of the shooting and the technology of video production, and also the cast, the good, good actors. But the basic question arises here, in terms of the 80s content, how much of it is original or new and how much can stimulate us to think? Or is it just uh, consuming a reality we knew? Uh, we know. I think we can address this uh, same question to the, 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 popular, uh, the popular Korean drama, Squid Game, and what's new in that, uh, in that drama. Yeah, here. <sighs> Okay, uh, this is my response to the speech of Mr. Zhang Hun and due to the language and the translation problem, I may also have some uh, misunderstandings on his, uh, his opinion. So I can only respond uh, to uh, artist speech on the level I understand. And uh, uh, sorry for speaking too fast and uh, because uh, I, I have a, a limited time, so I have to go very fast. Thank you, all of you, and please be safe. If you look at Lefmanovich's five principles of new media, they are numerical representation, modularity, automation, variability, and sign conversion. In relation to my work, it seems to be related to the invisible and immaterial form of digital. Digital art without the materiality exists only in the form of electrons that cannot exist on their own. For this reason, digital has relied its identity on a form that contains an image without the original. Also, this includes visual art, computer art, internet art, and multimedia art, through works that give materiality to digital media and temporality to print and drawings. They overcome each other's shortcomings and create visual stimulation. So most of all my works consist of a combination of analog and digital media. Although invisible, it is a conceptual modular and is represented in the same way as pixel structures or codes. It can be seen that the process of capturing the video and pixelating the screen when the audience stands in front of it like an interactive work is automated as if written in code in advance. In addition, the previous sculpture implemented in virtual reality seems to be able to present the variability of its existence based on the five principles of new media. The combination of digital media which has no materiality but temporality and analog media which has no temporality but materiality seems to be one of the major trends in the exhibition of art using media in the 21st century, I think that these digital characteristics became indispensable during the pandemic. My works follow the sequence of reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality. And it seems that culture, art, and social economy are becoming increasingly dematerialized. If this work made you consider that even for a while, I think it would be worthwhile. Thank you. This concludes all the sessions of the conference. This international conference was, has been presented in a hybrid format, and in the session we looked into revitalization of everyday life through technology and art in the Anthropocene ebook through nine different sessions as well as the discussions. When in the presence of various academic experts, 
from Home and Abroad Critics, Curators, and Designers, we have had a conversation with a field expert as well, restoring techne as the original comprehensive meaning of technology art, especially here, eco-techne, and how to restore our environment and daily life through the technology of art in mutual interaction and awareness of relationship. This is what we have deeply looked into, and it was a meaningful time to contemplate how artists and researchers should strive with the sincerity in the process of change. Unfortunately, we were not able to have a general discussion because this session and this entire conference is presented in a virtual format, but it was quite a unique experience for us to have this in-depth discussion and the questions as well. I'd like to express my gratitude to the presenters who shared the, their research outcome and to the discussant who conducted meticulous questions and discussions. My special thanks to thanks go to all the participants who are joining us virtually. I would like to thank many people who have made this conference possible. Common Intention Triennale 2021 runs till November 7th. In this time of autumn, please come and visit Hongcheon and Taiwan International Triennale Exhibition and take some time to think about the relationship and issues of art and techne in daily life and revitalization as we have discussed through this conference. Thank you.